Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the open session of the Nuclear and Radiation Studies Board. My name is Will Toby. Um, we have a very interesting program ahead of us this afternoon. As a reminder to our board members, staff, invited speakers, and audience, the National Academies are committed to the principles of diversity, integrity, civility, and respect in all our activities. All forms of discrimination, harassment, and bullying are prohibited in any National Academies activity. This applies to all participants in all virtual and in-person meetings in which the National Academies activities are conducted. We look to you to be a partner in this commitment by helping us to maintain a professional and cordial environment. So once again, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining this open session. We will begin with a presentation from Dr. Paul Black, who is the founder and head of Neptune and Company, an environmental consulting company with a mission to improve the quality of environmental decision-making through the application of state-of-the-art methods in statistics and data science, risk assessment, decision analytics, and stakeholder engagement, as well as environmental model modeling and quality assurance. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Black. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to present to you all. Um, hopefully you find this interesting, we'll see. And thanks to Charles Ferguson, who I guess listened to something similar at Waste Management mm -hmm. and asked if I would come and do this here. So um, hopefully this works for you all. Um, it, um, would it be beneficial at all to actually see me talking instead of um, having my video turned off? Is there a preference at all? I think so, if, if it wouldn't be too much of an inconvenience. No, no worries. Okay, there we go. Just don't have a very interesting background, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, Darlene, I think you have the presentation and move it forwards. Yeah, just uh, one moment, Paul Darlene is teeing it up. Okay, sounds good. Well, I can, I can start um, while she's teeing it up, if you like, so there's no silence. But um, this, this is a presentation about um, something that is currently called structured decision making. Uh, I'll get into it some, but it's the flavor of decision analysis, if you like. And really, the way we think about it at Neptune is as an approach to Alara. And I'll, I'll try to tie that together a little bit more as well. Um, within Neptune, we started this program in the late 1990s. And it was mm -hmm. me and one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Tom Stockton. And then we... Um, soon grabbed uh, my wife, who is now the president of our company, Kelly Black, into this as well. And as we've grown, we've um, we've got more of our colleagues working in this area. So um, next one, please. So I mean, basically what we're trying to do here, at least in the world of radioactive contamination, is how to make more efficient and cost effective decisions and and perhaps the the first question is why um, perhaps that's obvious to a lot of people but um, the next slide shows the way at least um, we've been thinking about why is this necessary so next one so in at the top of this, why do we make disposals so difficult? And as I said at the Waste Management Conference as well, I've limited that to three O's because I couldn't fit any more in the title line. But we, we make this incredibly <laughs> difficult. And look, I look at this as um, we have essentially radioactive waste management wagging the nuclear industry dog. And if we don't have good disposal options, we're impacting our ability to have a nuclear energy industry. So questions that we might ask internally are, well, what do we want, nuclear energy or fossil fuel, nuclear energy or climate change? And we, we also have, um, as, as you're all aware, I'm sure, GAO, GAO reports on the state of um, 
of DOE's approach, at least, to dealing with its legacy problems. And um, our environmental liability from that continues to grow, even, uh, even as we continue to do work. So we should find better ways to use our scarce resources, or, or perhaps otherwise um, put our resources to better use if we can find better solutions here. Um, and some of this means moving beyond simple compliance assessments. And compliance has a role. I mean, don't, don't get us wrong here. It, it really does. But uh, there's different ways of making better decisions and, and hence using resources more effectively. And later in the presentation, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on some programs at IAEA trying to head in this direction, but also in very briefly what the UK has been doing. And we'll see if we can get them to give a presentation to you in the future. Um, other thoughts on this are 40 years of practice and changes in technology, let alone society, since regulations were first written on typewriters. I mean, may, maybe with that 40 years of, of experience, we could actually rethink how we should be doing this so that we're much more effective at it. Um, and I, I was at um, a waste management conference years ago at the time where the Nuclear Regulatory Commission held Friday sessions after waste management. And I, I asked some questions in one of them when they put up a list of what they call priorities, which I, I think really were urgencies. But um, one of the questions I asked when they talked about 100 years of disposal in our future still, and my question was, well, do we still want to be asking these same questions 100 years from now? Or do we want to actually deal with it? I mean, we, we have um, different problems here that are caused by, by um, various levels of conservatism within our system uh, on top of a, a regulatory structure that is complex, to say the least. So next, next slide. So the next one, darling, can you hear me still? Uh, do, okay. Paul, do you want the complex modeling one or is the that this one? Or, um, yeah, right there. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. So um, we, we tend to approach um, a radioactive contamination, especially radioactive waste disposal with performance assessments that are really long-term complex modeling. And may, maybe we should be asking why. We, we model into the distant future that's fraught with vast uncertainties that increase with time, and yet our models don't accommodate increased uncertainty with time, um, partly because that's difficult to do and partly because we wouldn't know where to take it, I don't think. Um, future changes in technology, society, and even evolution are not accounted for. I mean, we 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 built a model for um, Clive in Utah that um, because it was depleted uranium and part of the regulation talked about um, peak dose um, without really connecting what that means, um, we, we ended up modeling two million years into the future. And at that point, I'd say evolution has a role to play as well. Um, the pure economics of the problem, discounting is allowed under ALARA and should be, but that should then limit how far we're modeling into the future. And it, all of this seems disconnected from um, performance objectives, which are more or less stated for present day conditions. But we're, we're also looking at long compliance periods where you know, we, even the, a, the NRC had a diagram at one point that had, um, I see a time on the x-axis and uncertainty on the y-axis, and it was a cartoonish diagram, but it acknowledged that uncertainty in societal change happens so fast mm -hmm. that you know, it, it's, and we've all seen that in our lifetimes. I mean, I couldn't call home in the 1980s when my parents moved because I had no phone to call from. And my kids will ask me, why didn't you use your cell phone? You know, technology has changed so fast and will continue to do so, but we don't account for that when we're modeling out thousands, if not millions of years into the future. 
And obviously with environmental uncertainty, natural catastrophes are, are likely to happen and we're seeing them more and more now, um, partly because of climate change, but they're going to happen anyway. So next slide. So we can, if I wanted to really oversimplify uh, PA models, science models for radioactive waste disposal, I, I think we've got enough experience with this at this point that we could say almost if there's water or erosion and people, then there's a potential problem. And if there's no water and no erosion or no people, then there's not much of a problem. And that, that's an oversimplification but where I really want to go with this is we build massive complex models first. And what we should be doing probably is addressing the decision problem first and using the decision problem to understand what level of modeling do we actually need to solve the decision problem. Um, I, I had a note down there partly because of work we've been doing with the IAEA, but um, just acknowledge that the US and the Western world have resources beyond what the rest of the world have. And so in, in some ways, the, the cost model should be different around the world. I mean, we, we were looking at a site in Ukraine um, before the recent war, um, but um, that site um, was left over from the Soviet empire and had uranium all over the place but there were 150 businesses operating on the site. And they said, you can't clean this up. We're, we'd rather live with the contamination. They're very different value systems than we have perhaps, and, and certainly different cost structures that if we were dealing with this around the world, we, we'd have to be thinking about it more broadly. But in the US and the Western world, we, we have resources to address most of our contamination problems. Perhaps if we can, um, align them better with um, being more effective and efficient. So next one. So what, what we've been doing for um, quite some time, and we started this program with EPA in the late 1990s, um, but it, it's really decision science or structured decision making. And structured decision making is a term of art that was brought about by um, a book by Robin Gregory and his um, colleagues at the University of British Columbia at the time. That was in 2012. <clears throat> but really what they were following on from was Ralph Keeney's work in the 1990s on value-focused thinking. And th this is pro close to a quote from Ralph Keeney. I'm not sure I got it exactly right, but basically what he said was, the only reason we're making a decision is that we care about something maybe we should focus on what we care about first. Um, so basically address the value system before we work out what models we need to, to address the decision problem. Th this also leads to upfront stakeholder engagement because it's the stakeholders who, who have the value system that matters for a specific problem. <laughs> and um, in a way, what this also does is move us from the dad paradigm to the ed paradigm. The, these are, ed is a term that I'm now borrowing from the Environment Agency in the UK, but the, they, they changed their paradigm from decide, announce, defend to engage, deliberate, decide. And to just to um, maybe put that in pictures because my wife always says that I never put enough pictures in my slides. So next one. Here is a, um, a statue from a, um, a Dutch artist. If you move to the next slide, or maybe you have. Um, but the purpose of it is that planning must be deliber deliberative and collaborative. Then action can be taken quickly and carefully. I don't often hear that in our, our industry, but I have heard it a, a few times. Um, I heard it from Doug Hensey when he was in Los Alamos, for example, and to. Um, um, I forget the names now, but um, at National Cleanup Workshop, I've heard this occasionally, but it's not very often. And then there's also Einstein, who's quoted as saying at one point, if I had an, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about it and five minutes thinking about solutions. Um, 
that, that's sort of the path that we're going down with building out the decision structure is understand the problem and then you can find the right solutions to it. And in, in our industry, we tend to jump straight into scientific modeling instead of understanding the problem. So next one. And that, there's another there's another critical um, issue here as well that addresses conservatism. And I, I borrowed this quote from a, a person named Morgan Jones, who was actually a CIA analyst, but he wrote a book called The Thinker's Toolkit. And th this quote seemed to hit the mark to me. But the, the point is we should be separating values from science. And when, when we build conservative um, um, PA or risk assessment models, what we're actually doing is embedding our value system in the science. And that, that creates something that is um, really usually hard to understand. We might think it's easier because we've created conservatism, but conservatism is never what we really think it is. Um, in one direction, there may be conservatism, but if you're gonna buy conservatism in one direction, you've lost it in another direction. It's never what we think it is. So you know, that, that's one of the things that happens within decision analysis or, analysis or is required by the theory is we separate the value system from a science. So we separate utility from probability. That, that in a way makes the solutions more honest. And when we do a um, sensitivity analysis on these types of models, we might find that it's something on the probabilistic side that the, um, the, the conclusion or the response is sensitive to, but it might be on the value side instead. At least now we'll know. And I, I think about these things sometimes along the lines of Yucca Mountain and WIP, where you know, Yucca Mountain failed, not because of anything scientifically, but because of you know, being politics, really, and WIP is the same. WIP didn't succeed because of science so much as it did because it, it was driven by a value system. Jobs were wanted. And not that the science was irrelevant, but wasn't necessarily the driver for the decisions that have been made. Uh, next one. So where we go, structured decision-making, said earlier, Gregory's book and, and Keeney, so we can probably move on to the next one. But um, the last quote there from Keeney, values are what we fundamentally care about in decision-making. Alternatives or options are simply means to obtain our values. So especially in a situation where we're faced with um, um, competing stakeholders and competing objectives, and this sort of approach where you focus on the value system first works really well. Um, it, it helps bring stakeholders together when they all of a sudden realize that at a fundamental level, they share the same or at least similar value systems. It, it helps get conversation going as well. So next one. It, here's a diagram of, of how this works. Um, Actually, the, the USGS has a program that, that follows this same process. They have a slightly different uh, graph. It's the same process. You can find that by searching Google or something like that. Or these days, you use chat GPT or something. Um, but we, we start with understanding the context, which is basically making sure everybody in the room or stake, got a stake in this problem um, understand the background of the problem, where we are and what we're trying to achieve. So we understand the context of the problem and that all needs to be shared so that everybody's got a, a common playing field. <clears throat> then what we do is um, do an elicitation session with the stakeholders to address their value system, which, you know, it, it's there. So our job is facilitation or elicitation. All we're doing is trying to help them solve their own problem, them being the stakeholders and the decision makers. So we're trying to define objectives through um, their value system, through what matters to them. And then I, this, step three is now let's identify some options or alternatives that might actually achieve those objectives. Um, we, we jump from 
um, stakeholders at that point, also to subject matter experts, because we need to make sure that options are actually um, literally achievable. Um, there's no point having options in, in an, an evaluation that are not achievable. So some subject matter expertise is needed at that point. <clears throat> and then once that decision model is structured in this way, we can see what models or science models, cost models, whatever they are, are actually needed to solve the problem. And certainly subject matter expertise is needed in step four to both specify and evaluate options. And from that, you know, we could say take action, but I'd be a little careful and say that um, models are good at providing insights. Um, taking action purely based on a model might not be a, a great thing to do, but uh, um, certainly this system will throw out the optimal options or prioritize options or, or whatever's needed, basically in a decision, decision analysis context. So next one. So this, along the way, we're doing, um, if the community is one of the stakeholders, this is addressing community involvement. And we're describing the problem to them and then trying to understand what matters to the community, let alone other stakeholders or interested parties. And you know, most of the problems we're dealing with have a community um, stakeholder group that's going to be involved. Um, and then we'll identify alternatives with them, as I said a minute ago, and, and then we turn to the subject matter experts to complete the alternatives and the decision makers to select the best alternative. So next one is about the benefits of doing this. It helps that the problem's fully described. Um, the stakeholder engagement happens up front. It happens throughout. The whole process, um, although I, I always think that any process that is new to somebody, it, it, it always takes a few times to, um, to become familiar with it, but this really is easier to understand at the end of the day. It's easier to communicate and explain. The stakeholders are brought along every step of the way. It's their value system. Um, so they, they see what's going on. Their values are represented directly. And the whole system represents what you know, we could be in quotes there, but it's really the stakeholders and the subject matter experts. It's all based on what we think we know and what our uncertainties are. That is, it's basically trying to be honest. Um, you know, I, we, we were asked once, this is another Clive example, but we were asked to model Clive as if all the um, surrounding area was sand. And we said, why would we do that? And the answer that we got was, so you can push more water through the system. And we said, why would we do that? How are we expected to explain uh, conservatism in that sort of sense to anybody? You know, how does it make sense to, to build models that are conservative in, in strange ways like that and don't then actually represent the system that we're trying to model? Um, but... The whole process here of going through the value system, trying to work out what models we need to now solve the decision problem and bringing all the stakeholders and decision makers along every step of the way, it, it makes it very difficult to disagree with the solutions. It helps avoid redo. It helps avoid having to provide another rock. It's also technically defensible, reproducible, you know, lots of other sort of mum and apple pie words here that apply. So that, that's the system in a nutshell. In the next slide, I'll talk a little about um, an IAEA project where um, we have a report that's going through the system. We can switch to the next slide. And the report that's going through the system is a out essentially this is that we should change our paradigm so that we can make more efficient and effective decisions and i don't expect anybody to read this the, the previous one was the old way sorry go back a couple yeah so old way back one more slide 14 so slide 14 we we put these figures into the report that this was our interpretation of the way work is done now, where the focus is really on modeling. 
uh, or science modeling. And the decision issues come after that fact. And the new way on the next slide cha changes that script. So these figures are in our report, which is part of the Moderia group for IAEA. And that report will probably come out in the next year or two. Um, takes IAEA a long time to finally publish these reports. But the next two slides, I tried to simplify this into what we're really talking about. Um, if you get these slides, you're welcome to look at these in more detail and reach out if you have questions. But the next slide, in trying to simplify this, um, so slide 16, um, the old way is doing science first, risk and dose assessment second, statistics and decision analysis third, and stakeholder engagement fourth. So that's a simplification, admittedly, but this is typically how our work, how we undertake our work. And slide 17 then just flips that on its head. So really, if we if we want to try and find a better way of doing this, we should be doing it completely the other way around. So slide 17. My internet must be slow. So that, that's what we did in one of our IAEA reports. Um, and then I said I'd touch on what the UK is doing as well. This might be something that you want to look into some more on slide 18. But the, the UK has changed its regulatory guidance. And despite my accent, um, where work is concerned, I'm from the US. I, I've been here for, um, geez, 35 years now. And I, I'm I'm not nearly as aware of what's going on in the UK as you might be in some ways, but um, UK's regulatory guidance changed. I found this out by working with some of the uh, my um, um, British friends in IAA territory, and they this rewrite of their guidance is really very much along the lines of stakeholder engaged structured decision making. They might call it something else, but it's basically the same thing. And listening to some of them talk about the successes that are coming from this, <clears throat> I think would make it worthwhile for um, the US to at least see and understand what the UK has been doing. So they, they've changed it from the way we currently do our work in the US to a new paradigm, and it seems to be successful for them, as we think it would be. And then next slide is just trying to tie this back to Alara and picking on one definition of Alara that I picked up off the website. I think this is an NRC um, definition somewhere. But I mean, we all know what Alara means, but we're, we're trying to take into account the state of technology, the economics of improvements related to um, technology and to public health and safety and other societal and socioeconomic considerations. I mean, basically, Alara is, I mean, it's a description of decision analysis. And you know, when I first came into this industry, I sort of wondered, why aren't we doing decision analysis when Alara is crying out for it? And that, that's essentially what we're proposing here with structured decision making. I think the same applies to some other regulations in the US as well, that um, if you read the preambles to them, they're, they're basically saying it, it, it's about decision science. Let, let's do this in a, in a smart way. But somehow we haven't gone there very often. So that, that was the bulk of my presentation. I, I've written down on a few other slides, some example projects that we've worked on and put a uranium mill tailings example on the back end where we actually implemented this. This is at a, slight, a site in Slovenia, um, working with um, the IAEA and uh, Slovenian friends over there. But I'm happy to show the list of examples and walk you through the uranium mill tailings example or stop and address questions. Thank you, Dr. Black, for a very <clears throat> clear and refreshing presentation. Um, we now have some time for questions from board members and academy staff. So 
for those of you in your room in the room, please uh, raise your hand or your card. And for those of you online, raise your virtual hand. Looks like Allison has done so first. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, I completely agree with you about performance assessments and your understanding of the problem that the, the real problem is citing and the social aspects of it and not the technical aspects of it. And I've been saying that for probably decades now. Um, so basically what you're proposing is, as far as I understand it, and as far as I understand it, the, the problem in your view is the United States and their approach to high level nuclear waste disposal. Um, because what you're proposing is a safety case, and that's been used successfully in Finland and Sweden and uh, and in and many countries for their uh, siting of nuclear waste disposal, and successfully because they selected sites, and Finland is you know in the process of constructing the repository, and Sweden is close to begin constructing, etc. Um, and in fact, the use of a safety case was proposed by the Blue Ribbon Commission in 2012, on which I sat, and then the reset, um, the reset group in our report that came out in 2018. So we've been, the number of us have been saying this over and over again. Um, and, and I think you're right in identifying that the problem in the US is that really it's the sturds that have forced this use, this sort of sole reliance on um, modeling, complex modeling, as you point out, um, and, then the, and then the use of a basically a single number to decide whether the site is reasonable or not, instead of as you, one of your slides talked about all the, you know, you should be honest about all the issues that are associated with the particular site, et cetera. Um, and I completely agree with you there. So I just want to understand, are you talking about the U.S. specifically or other countries? Because I don't, I mean, a lot of countries that are further along now than the U.S. in terms of citing a repository have already adopted this method. I, I, you know more about that than me, but as my understanding is, in terms of citing, you're correct. In, in terms of other radioactive contamination issues, and the work we've been doing at IAEA is with, is a, a lot of it's been with Horst Monk and Fernandez, if you know Horst. But um, he's been trying to push in this direction, which is why we got together around eight years ago now. And he asked us to come over and help him with um, moving IAEA in this sort of direction as well. So mm -hmm. for, for citing, I know the UK and Canada have moved in this direction and the, the US is trying to perhaps. Um, but um, for things like remediation, decommissioning, um, let alone disposal, um, I, I think the IAEA and other countries um, mm -hmm would still benefit from this approach. I don't think that it that's well established yet. And IAEA is trying to establish that much more broadly than just for sizing. And, and do you use the term safety case? Because that's in the literature, that's the term of art. For this. Well, that, that's the term of art outside the US, yes. Right, so I know if, the US needs, I, yeah. I agree with you. The U.S. should be adopting a, a safety case. Un unfortunately for the U.S., the real sticking point is Congress, and Congress has to change the law for right. there to be progress on the on the high level nuclear waste piece of things. Well, that, that that was um, that the NRC meeting that I said that I attended and asked a question. That that was really what my question is all about. It's going to, it would take decades for us to change the system over here. But if we don't change it, we're going to be stuck with it for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So you know, somewhere it would be helpful if we could find the political will to change it. At least that's my my view. Yeah, I, I agree. Unfortunately, I've looked at this in detail and there's not a lot of incentives to, to make right. changes. 
<laughs> but very, anyway, yeah, very thank you. Yeah. Charles? Yeah, uh, Paul, uh, thank you so much. That was very enlightening, as Will said, refreshing. And so I, I, I kind of have a similar question to Allison, but I'm going to broaden it uh, a bit. So I, I, maybe it's in two parts. So I understand from when I heard a version of this presentation a couple months ago at the Waste Management Symposium, you had mentioned that you had gotten some uh, support, Neptune support from uh, Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management. So I think that's encouraging that, you know, DOEEM, at least some officials are receptive to this approach and uh, sounds like they're you know, willing to take it on board and and to uh, apply it. So maybe you, if you could speak to that a bit. And then kind of the, another question was, um, you know, for this board, Nuclear Radiation Studies Board, obviously, you know, our interest is on nuclear issues and nuclear waste management, and you spoke really directly to that. Uh, however, thinking about the structured decision-making approach, obviously it could apply to almost anything involving, you know, humans, it doesn't have to be water and erosion, but anything dealing with human beings and decision-making, yes. especially um, group um, decision-making, whether it's on climate or energy choices or anything that really matters to the human beings and that they value. So uh, maybe if you could touch on kind of the broader applications of structured decision-making to um, areas outside of nuclear waste disposal. Thanks. I, I can touch on what we've done and I, I know um, other decision analysts have worked on various other projects and you know, we, we call this structured decision making in part because it's a term of art. Um, but really, when Robin Gregory and his colleagues wrote their book, they they really only um, pursued as far as the value system left it there. Whereas Ralph Keeney originally essentially a Bayesian decision analysis, and that, that's what we're doing here. Ultimately, mathematically, this is Bayesian decision theory. Um, in terms of uh, where this can be applied, I mentioned my colleague, um, Dr. Tom Stockton, at the beginning of this. And internally, we were all chatting about this once. And Tom said, um, in, in answer to what could we apply this to, <clears throat> he said, um, well, we can apply this to any decision problem. And every problem is a decision problem. So you know, it, it has broad applicability. I, I, I think challenges um, beyond that are, are uh, sets and capacity. Um, you know, this analysis has been around since the 19th, if not earlier. Um, it, it works in some situations, but there are other arenas that haven't picked up on the value of it. And it may maybe in in our industry here we we're in part um I, I think about this in terms of recurrent circular as well, but a little bit differently. Um, but we had scientists drive us up and maybe would have benefited if, if oh, there had been different drivers early on, to sure. In, in terms of oh, other sorry applications. To interrupt, but, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you were breaking up. But maybe if you can turn off your uh, camera, that would help with your bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Showing your internet is uh, kind of low. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm actually out of town, and so... Um, Internet's not as good as I'm used to, I guess. Um, but um, going back to other examples that we've worked on, and I put a list of them on that slide. Which one was it? Slide 20, maybe? Looking um, for EPA, and it's a short list of ones for EPA. They're, they're always fun and interesting. But one of them was about brownfields revitalization. Um, we actually did a project that 
the city of Cleveland called Reimagining Cleveland, where their concern was that um, they'd lost half their population in the last 50 years and they need to get it back. What do they need to do? Um, we've done um, resiliency planning for climate change at three different locations, stormwater quality issues. We did coral reef management in Puerto Rico. Um, we, we solved the problem for dairy farms in Louisiana. Um, and then outside of EPA, we've, we use this approach for chemical warfare agent cleanup in Umatilla, um, some UXO problems. Uh, for FDA, we built them a, a system for prioritizing and uh, mitigating foodborne illnesses. We're currently working on one associated with geothermal energy development. And it's just a wide range of, of different problems. It goes back to what Tom said. Every problem is a decision problem. So um, I, th I think if for simple problems, this approach isn't needed. But where there's complexity, especially complexity with stakeholders and competing objectives or... or Probably one thing I used to say was um, I mean, humans are not very good at solving problems that have more than three or four moving parts. And in, in the problems we're dealing with in, in this world, radiation, we, we tend to have many more than three or four moving parts. So within the um, DOE community, I, I, I see that a, a couple of people that we're working with are on the call, um, Paul Bembia and Brad Frank, unless I missed a few others. Um, but we're working at West Valley. I, I would say that we're, we're, not, we're not following a strict um, structured decision-making paradigm of starting from there. But I don't think that's um, the, the, the fault of, of, the pro, of, of the West Valley program. I think it's more um, endemic than that in the US as Alison was pointing to. But we are nevertheless building a decision analysis um, end to that for optimization um, to decide how to de decommission phase two at West Valley. In Los Alamos, we um, looks like we, we started this program in Los Alamos when Doc Hinsey was there. Then he retired and COVID came along at the same time. So it's been on hold for several years. And one of the reasons I'm in Los Alamos this week is to try to resurrect it. So we might get that going. Um, up at Hanford, we actually implemented this for a very small part of their environmental surveillance program, um, which I mean, the, the objective there is to, I'll say, optimize their environmental surveillance program. But you really, the other way of putting that is, um, in this particular case, is having seen 20 years of data that um, that shown no releases, why do we still have an environmental surveillance program that's um, looking for releases in the way that it is? It needs to be optimized, which I think means minimize the current approach and introduce something new and different but we, that that we will undertake that with stakeholder engagement using this type of approach thank you <clears throat> i guess i'll I take the prerogative of the you. chair and ask a question um <clears throat> this may be a heretic heretical question but um it's long struck me that we might be too ambitious in our expectations. We know, for example, that dry cask storage is relatively cheap and effective, safe. Um, the drawback is it may only last 100 years before you need to take action again. But we've, and given the half-life of the nuclear waste that we're dealing with, that that won't be sufficient. But we've dealt with other long-life problems in other realms of public policy. And if, for example, I said that I had a plan to solve poverty for, but it would only last 100 years, it's not like people would say, well, get out of my office. Um, so I guess my question to you is that are we, are we looking at this problem in, in the wrong way? 
and should we fundamentally rethink, no, I, or is I, that heretical? I, I, I think so, at least to some extent. I mean, go, going down this path, um, I, I think that the very long time frames that we look at at least need to be thought about differently. Um, in, in a in a purely economic decision analysis sense, where we include any form of discount factor, I mean, even social discount factors run, uh, according to the literature, around one to three percent. If if we're doing any form of discounting then modeling out beyond a thousand years is not useful for decision purposes. It, it might be useful in a sense for insights, but there's so much uncertainty in the future, even that's hard to, to justify in some ways. Um, so, and yeah, we, we tend to think that, uh, and we did, we wrote a, a short paper in Radway Solutions along these lines that um, changing our, a uh, regulatory approach that's based on compliance periods to one that is more, more based on um, rolling windows and learning as we go, but you know, making decisions, learn some more, see if the decision stays or needs to be changed. But do it in, a, in the context of rolling windows a little bit more along the lines of either RECRA or SERPA would, would be beneficial. Thank you. Are there any further questions from board members or academy staff? Just a, oh, a, Allison. Just a comment, <laughs> Will, and that's the one problem with your plan to do these rolling decisions uh, and, you know, or use interim storage and then change it out every hundred years is the question of who's going to pay for that. Sure. Um, so yeah. that's yeah. why we really need to have a more robust uh, permanent solution because we don't know the future and we don't know whether institutions are going to exist to protect us in the future. And I think we're already getting intimations that uh, they won't be around in the future because uh, they've proved to be, they're proving to be unreliable. So, yeah. I mean, it, it might depend on the situation, but even if you've got permanent disposal, you're going to be monitoring it. Um, and I think it's still along those lines that we look at um, generational monitoring. We, we did a subject matter elicitation in the 1990s at, you know, at um, Nevada test site for the low level waste sites. And um, that, that was where those subject matter experts came out was we should be revisiting these problems generationally, whereas our regulations are not set up that way. They're set up instead to address compliance periods. And I'm not sure we're actually you know, at the end here saying different things. We might be thinking about it slightly differently, but permanent disposal is fine. It, it's still going to be monitored. And the question is, what does that look like? Thank you. Um, I think with that, um, we can turn to our next presentation um, from Dr. Andrea DiCarlo, who is the Director of Radiation and Nuclear Countermeasures Program at the Division of Allergy Immunology and Transplantation at the National Institute of Allergy and, of, and Infectious Diseases in the National Institutes of Health. Dr. DiCarlo. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of acronyms. Congratulations. Um, so uh, this for me is the ultimate experience because I'm truly hybrid. I am in the room and I'm speaking to people and I'm also on the Zoom. So this is just a wonderful experience. And um, thank you so much to everybody uh, who was on the Nuclear uh, Radiation Studies Board who recommended me to be a speaker today. I'm delighted with the opportunity and it was a beautiful drive downtown. I got to see the tidal basin and, and what's left of the cherry blossoms. So that's an unusual experience, experience for me at this point. But um, as mentioned, I am the director of the Radiation and Nuclear Countermeasures Program. We are a part 
of NIAID, which you can see on the screen. I'm not going to go through it again. And so many people know our former boss, Dr. Fauci. So um, privileged uh, to be able to work with him over the years and, uh, of course, wishing him all the best. So and I also see on the line, I did a little self-promotion. I sent the email link out. So I do see a lot of people from our program, awardees from the program. Um, and so maybe you'll see some mention of your data, and I hope I do it justice. But um, in any case, I want to also mention that I joined the NIAID in 2004. I was previously a research professor at Catholic University around the corner from here. And uh, I only became the director in 2019 right before COVID. So it's, it's been a wild ride. And hopefully I can take you a little bit on that ride and uh, just discuss a little bit out of our, our program. So uh, we were established uh, way back in 2004. So this was pretty much in the aftermath of 9-11. The Cold War had largely ended. People weren't thinking about radiation all the time. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we need to really be paying attention to these CBRN threats. So uh, in 2004, Congress said, we're going to give money to the NIH. Um, and we spend that money as part of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And we are a funding agency. So we are tasked with taking that, that important um, funding from Congress and putting it into uh, different mechanisms that we have. So we fund grants, which are R01s and PO1s, um, cooperative agreements. We do contracts. Uh, we actually have some specialized contracts. Uh, I see Dr. Polly Chang is on the call. She is the PI of one of our product development contracts at SRI. And we also do interagency agreements where we provide funds to really leverage uh, government subject matter expertise in other areas. Uh, so, but above all, we do funding. We're not bench scientists anymore, although we all used to be. And our research priorities are, are really threefold. One is we need to develop drugs and get them into the stockpile so that our nation can be better prepared if the unthinkable happens with regards to a radiological or nuclear incident. So every day I hope that the work that we do is never going to be needed. But we're talking about large, uh, large doses of radiation within our program. Um, I've heard some discussions of low dose. We are definitively high dose. So we're looking at zero gray up until uh, unsurvivable doses in the, probably the 10 to 12 gray range. And the products that we develop have to be useful at 24 hours or later because our mandate is for civilian populations. We won't know in advance. So DOD, NASA, other agencies cover that protective element where you can give something ahead of time, but it's probably going to take 24 hours or longer for us to get anything out there. So that's, that's sort of our line in the sand. Um, the next part is, is also products, but products to remove radionuclide contamination. And I'll talk about all these in more detail on later slides. And the third one is what we call biodisymmetry. So this is taking biomarkers of exposure, biological um, endpoints that you see in people who have been exposed and trying to translate them into a device that can tell if someone's been exposed or not. And also uh, taking those biomarkers and being able to track them and telling you know, physicians, okay, this person is probably gonna need an early treatment. So it's to triage a lot of people in a short amount of time and to guide medical management. The possible scenarios that we think about are, again, unthinkable. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to believe that there's the possibility of these things happening, but we are tasked with detonation of a nuclear device, uh, power plant accidents or attacks. Um, hidden radiation emitting devices, and also radiation dispersal devices or dirty bombs, um, and just being concerned with a generalized radionuclide that could be released in, in a number of different ways. So when the body experiences radiation, the first thing in some, some particulate radiation concerns, uh, you need to get sometimes particles that have been inside the body, you need to get them out. The classic example, which I mentioned to a teenager, and they had no idea what I was talking about, was uh, Alexander Litvinenko, who was um, poisoned. He ingested polonium. Perhaps if they had identified it sooner or if we had uh, greater tools available, I suspect he would have lived longer. I'm not sure he would have survived given the dose he received, but we're developing um, compounds to address those concerns. And then we call medical countermeasures, or MCMs, to treat both the acute um, symptoms of radiation exposure and those delayed effects that can happen. So acute tends to be gastrointestinal and bone marrow. Those are generally very sensitive organs. And then you have a lot of things that can come up later. We're also concerned with combined injuries. So that tends to usually be a cutaneous burn or a wound in combination with radiation, which really is a bad thing in terms of survival. But that can also incorporate hemorrhage with radiation, fracture with radiation, um, uh, sepsis with radiation. So there's a, a whole range of combined injuries that we've been involved in. And then, of course, biodisymmetry, this being um, a graphic from AFRI uh, that we work with closely. So across the 
I guess now 18 plus years of our program, we've had the opportunity to test a number of different medical countermeasures. You'll see that most of them are in the hematopoietic range because this is the most sensitive organ. And so th there was a lot in the clinical space already to address hematopoietic injuries. And so that's sort of where we went initially. Uh, but you can see now that we've, uh, I'll discuss in a moment, we've had some successes in treating bone marrow injuries. We've been focusing in on other areas in terms of medical countermeasures. And of course, we've always um, had radionuclide and, and and biodosimetry. I'll be talking in more details about um, those programs. And radionuclide is, is actually starting to become more prominent um, in terms of decorporation and blocking. So we view our program as a continuum. We fund both basic research, your, base, your bread and butter R01 type activities, mechanistic, hypothesis driven. How can we uh, identify targets that radiation injury manifests in a cell or tissue? Um, and can, we need to develop animal models of those exposures so that we can do preclinical testing. And then we have sort of our mid-stage development. This tends to be um, contracts where a lead candidate has been identified and we wanna do things like, can we make it in a formulation that'll work better? IB perhaps is not the best formulation for mass casualty, for example. We wanna try to understand some of the safety that might be available for it. And then we have advanced development. And this is a, an activity that, um, that we are involved in from beginning to end, but the advanced development does tend to be carried out um, with some of our other partners in a, in a more focused way. We're always thinking about regulatory affairs. How can we move these products forward to the Food and Drug Administration? We need to get them licensed for their acute radiation or delay syndromes so that they can be stockpiled. And again, we have a number of partners in this effort. We work with academic institutions, uh, through companies and contractors, and then our partners at BARDA and FDA to get some of these advances through, the, through to the finish line. So I've mentioned the FDA a couple of times. They have a unique licensure pathway that's used for ChemBio rad nuke threats. And in order to do that, uh, it's basically when you cannot do clinical trials. We cannot, except for certain cancer patients that provide supportive information through a radiation, we can't just say, hey, we'll just give you a little radiation. Uh, so those challenge trials are not permitted. So as a consequence, we have to carry out preclinical um, investigations. And there's four points that the FDA requires us to do in appropriate animal models to help ascertain what the mechanism of action, both of the radiation and the drug is. We have to do pivotal studies, which are done typically in at least one animal model that's predictive of the human response. You have to have a primary endpoint, which is usually at least a survivability, increased survival, but there are other endpoints that are certainly considered. And all of those things that you do preclinically have to direct you to be able to select an appropriate dose of the drug in humans. Um, so there's a lot of pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic activities that happen um, along the way. Sometimes uh, the FDA is probably going to require, if we ever have to use these drugs in this situation, that we'd have some kind of post-marketing. And uh, I would point out that the biodisymmetry devices actually do not use the animal rule per se. Um, so I give the 21 CFR code there. If you want to go and read the regulations, I've been reading them for decades. So uh, I'm going to start a little bit with some of the advances that we've had in these individual organ systems, as mentioned on that first slide. So uh, we, are, we were initially very concerned with the bone marrow injuries, potentially myeloblative doses of radiation that people might experience. So, you know, going back quite a while in 2010 and even earlier, you're going to see we have a lot of meetings and uh, we write a lot of meeting reports because we don't like our information to remain siloed. But we became early, early adapters of what was going on in the oncology space and trying to see if we could repurpose. For example, Nupagen has been repurposed. Um, Nulasta has also been repurposed for uh, acute radiation syndrome. Uh, Leukine, Sargramistin, which is uh, GM CSF, so that hit both the granulocyte and the macrophage lineages, and then end plate. So represented here are the what I would call four success, recent successes um, in terms of developing drugs for stockpiling. Um, our group has been involved, uh, directly involved in three of them. Um, Leukine uh, came so, solely through BARDA for its licensure. And, and you know, these are at different stages of stockpile. Either they were there, they're being moved in and out. You'll, you'll see that uh, our um, advanced development uh, groups often put out procurement requests to, to purchase these particular drugs. 
We've also been very interested in cellular therapies because they're, we had to provide a protected space because people are like, well, why would you use a cellular therapy if you can use a growth factor? And it's just that cellular therapies are sometimes, if you truly have a, a very myeloablative experience for a patient, you may need to use cellular therapy. So we had, again, a workshop on this particular topic. Um, I'm just showing here the general lineages that everybody needs to be concerned about. Um, and, and we've looked at, for example, a placentally derived stem cells as a therapy, a uh, number of progenitor cells. So we've looked at um, multi-stem, which is um, targets a couple of these common progenitors, um, myeloid cells, megakaryocyte lineages, um, and also platelets. So these are all, all of these uh, different blood components work together to help ensure survival. So we, we try to have um, programs in each area so we're not missing anything. Uh, the GI tract is uh, the next to, well, actually, it would be the first to succumb, but it is not the most sensitive. Um, people who are exposed to very high doses could succumb from GI injury in, in days to weeks. Uh, there's a number of different medical countermeasure approaches, general categories that we've looked at. Some of those are shown here. Uh, things like uh, the cellular therapies that I mentioned, things that block cytokines. Uh, we have a, a more recent um, endeavor into microbiome-focused science, so we just funded a consortia, um, a consortium of uh, cooperative agreements where they work together, and uh, they're focusing in on the potential of harnessing the microbiome, not only as a potential biomarker of injury, but as a treatment modality. And uh, we also have things focused on the vasculature. I think many people in the research, radiation research field understand that radiation is truly a vascular problem. Uh, it, it does have all of these other um, implications, but, but the vasculature is, is common to all of these different organ systems and is like the impact on the blood vessels are likely responsible for the kind of multi-organ injury that you see, and not just as a vessel moving um, things around the body, but also as a responding um, organ within the body. And so we have things that have been focused on these vascular, uh, and then I like to call these the antis, so the anti-apatotics, all of the ones you see listed here are, of course, the first thing that we look to, knowing that oxidative stress, apoptosis, inflammation result from these kinds of radiation exposures. Uh, because the GI, uh, before the, because the HEME has been doing really well, we've actually shifted some of our program emphasis more to skin. So we anticipate that there are going to be skin injuries. Uh, we do our efficacy testing that we support is primarily in these different small, um, small mid-sized animals, uh, mouse and rat models of radiation-induced skin injury, um, guinea pigs. You see here, uh, this is, I think this is a mini pig up in the top right here, and also some human ex vivo models of skin. Uh, so we actually support research in, in a lot of these different animal models with the end goal, of course, is selecting an animal that really uh, mi mimics what you'd expect in humans. And generally speaking, pigs are used in dermatology extensively. They're, they're believed to be um, central to uh, understanding human skin responses. So we feel like we're on the right track there. We've also done a number of kinds of radiation exposures. There's a concern, for example, that there might be fallout, which maybe we need to worry about beta exposures or gamma exposures. And we've used a lot of different uh, devices to achieve those kinds of injuries. And we've also done, again, these combined injuries. And the endpoints have varied. Uh, we've been working with several groups and also with the FDA. We held a meeting on cutaneous radiation injury at the request of the FDA uh, to understand what are the best endpoints to look at. Because with skin, it's not so much survival as it is, are you able to heal that wound quickly and diminish the, the draw that that patient will have on medical resources? So if you can get them out earlier and they don't need to be, for example, under critical care for a particular wound, then that's something you want to do. Um, skin injury are also known to be have a latency associated with them. They may appear to heal, and then weeks, months, sometimes even years later, because of the nature of radiation damage to the underlying structures, these can reopen. So it's, it's really insidious, and it's not like thermal burn, although we've looked to the thermal burn community to try to identify countermeasures that might work. And we're playing around in our program with some novel imaging methods so that we can see Something, a wound may appear to be healed on the surface, but it's teeming with inflammation underneath. So we've looked at things like infrared imaging, ultrasounds, and we're trying to come up with ways that are quantitative so that we can go to the FDA and say, this is the percent change you actually see in this injury with this particular compound. Uh, this is a, just a really brief overview of the kinds of things that we've invested in. 
And again, as I mentioned, we did have a meeting. These are the medical countermeasures that were discussed during that meeting, um, just to see what the FDA really wants. We have to be essentially in lockstep with the Food and Drug Administration because our eventual goal is to bring products to them. So we work very closely, make sure we're using the right models, the right endpoints, and we try to provide that guidance back even to our very early stage investigators. So they're always, they may be doing just, hey, we think this pathway is involved, but they're always thinking about what the potential endpoint could be of the uh, things that we're funding them to study. So as I mentioned previously, we do anticipate radiation combined injuries are going to make up a lot of the injuries that we're going to see if there is especially a detonation event. Uh, and that's, we know that at least in the animal models and also from what we have in human data that I'll mention in a moment, that it does definitely um, make your prognosis much worse if you've got uh, one injury on top of another in terms of survivability. Um, I'm showing here an LD50 curve. Uh, can you guys see mine? Yeah, you can see. Okay, so this LD50 tells you basically what dose of radiation is survivable um, in the different models. Uh, these are um, these are murine because we don't really do combined injury in monkeys, which is our, our gold standard animal model. But you can see here that the LD50 for radiation alone could be in the particular mouse models as high as 9 to 10 gray. However, when you combine it with burn or wound, the survivability goes down, so the curve shifts to the left. Um, and this has also been seen in retrospective analysis of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I know Amy, our epidemiologist in the room, is um, familiar with some of these data. And also, uh, this particular table was given to me by Dr. Alice Shapiro, who's previously at the FDA, and she was a first responder at uh, Chernobyl. And so what they found is that um, of the victims that did develop an acute radiation syndrome, a diagnosed ARS, um, almost nearly half of them had concomitant radiation burns along with that radiation total body exposure. So this is clearly something we need to think about. And we've done a lot of investment in early animal models, but we tend to tell people get to the FDA for radiation first, and then the combined injuries will come later in, in other kinds of studies. Uh, the delayed effects of acute radiation exposure, again, deer, these are the late impacts from an acute exposure. Uh, we have a number of animal models that we've used. You can see those here, both small and large models. Uh, we also, um, we are very cognizant of the fact that these are very precious animals. We are required by FDA to do work in non-human primates. Um, and previously that was done in rhesus monkeys, but with the advent of COVID, and the fact that China is no longer exporting the animals, um, the whole research community is kind of shifting around into other species that might be available. Um, we can do partial body irradiations because if your animal is going to develop some of these late effects, it has to survive the early ones. And since the late effects require higher doses to actually manifest an injury, we often will shield part of the bone marrow of the animal so that we can ensure their survival uh, so that they can develop late effects. So that's what we call our PBI or partial body models. We um, also study cardiovascular effects and all the previous work we did with bone marrow and has involved TBI or total body radiation. Um, and we, of course, in cutaneous, we've done, for example, high dose irradiation focused with or without trauma. And we've also, through the work that we've developed um, with uh, contractors and um, grantees in our program, identified that there are actually late GI and um, hematopoietic syndromes. So those are not always thought about when you think about these late lung and kidney complications, but uh, that is another area that uh, science that we fund has been able to um, develop. So in terms of the medical countermeasures approaches that we've looked at for lung, again, you have your antis, uh, these general categories. We also look at immune modulators. Um, interesting things like surfactants and mucociliary clearance drugs are also have been a part of our portfolio in the past with the understanding that maybe you can't, maybe you'll have uh, particulates that you need to get out by coughing them up or removing them through mucociliary clearance. So those are all approaches that over the years we've been able to support. Um, kidney is something that's really coming into the program more recently. It's, it happens after lung, but we do have some models that seem to show kidney injury consistent with what's been seen in humans. Um, that's primarily looking at ACE inhibitors. So again, lisinopril, losartan, those kinds of drugs which are already licensed and we're able to repurpose. And then of course we have these cardiovascular um, and these delayed GI and heme syndromes that are shown here. Uh, 
we did have a meeting on lung, as I mentioned, lots of meetings. Um, and just to kind of show you the data, these data were generated in non-human primates. And as a late effect of radiation exposure, you can get the development of uh, fibrotic lesions in the lung. So you see here, uh, the lungs are outlined in light blue, and then the pink areas are in um, are in the fibrotic areas. And so we want to avoid the development of both the pneumonitis, which is the infiltration response, and also the fibrosis. So things like statins were studied early on in the program. Um, you can see here when an animal is given 15 gray exposure, uh, you get a pretty rapid decrease in survival, but still, you know, 24 weeks, I guess, isn't that rapid. But um, however, when you use a statin, you can improve overall survival. So that's a repurposing that we did pretty early on in the program. Um, there's also, this is the data I mentioned on lisinopril. Um, this is in a rat model, and you can see you have to give a pretty high dose, uh, but it's a shielded model, so the animals do survive, and you can get a dramatic improvement um, with something that uh, lisinopril has probably been in millions of people over the years. So this is an approach we're very interested in. Uh, biodissymmetry. So again, we want to be able to identify biomarkers of injury that can be used to guide medical management and qu hopefully quickly sort people into, you can go home, you need to stick around, we need to do some more studies to make sure we understand what your exposure looked like. Ideally, we'd have a device that would be able to read it quickly. I think we all learned from COVID how these devices can be made. Uh, it would be wonderful if there were some kind of very quick self-assessment that could happen. I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but the idea that you could do a very quick sampling, um, ideally, they wouldn't cost a lot of money, they'd be fast and they wouldn't use something that's invasive. I think as invasive as we've been looking at has been a finger stick. Uh, so we use these biomarkers also, in addition to determining who needs treatment, you can also use them as pharmacodynamic uh, markers. So you can see if a medical countermeasure is working or you can use it, for example, to bridge a medical countermeasure. For example, um, radiation might bump up a particular cytokine and you drop it back down with your product and you show it in humans and you show it in animals. So it's a nice, uh, bridge across these different species, or of course humans being one of them. Uh, we do fund a lot of work, and I, you know, I see over there Sally is a, a part of that effort uh, that we do cytogenetics and generalized omics. So of course this shown here is the, the gold standard. These are um, uh, dicentric chromosomal assays. Cytogenetics are of course DNA damage induced by radiation exposure. Uh, I don't know. These may be your data. Um, <laughs> Maybe not. We have a lot of them, that, these heat maps that show uh, different genes getting turned on and turned off by radi different radiation exposure levels. And of course, had a meeting on that as well. So we're always, t we're always testing the water, seeing what research is going on, and trying to go back to what the F FDA wants so that we make sure we keep everybody aligned. Our current portfolio, we have early through advanced stage development. And again, what we try to do is give access to samples, provide funding to our awardees so that they can do the preclinical studies, put together briefing packages, which with the end goal of eventually going to the FDA, and in this case, it's called an investigational device exemption, or IDE. Recall, it doesn't go through the animal rule. There are different pathways, different personalities, but we try our best to ensure that these, these disparate areas of our portfolio um, are well recommended, are well um, addressed. Uh, we also like the idea of using biomarkers of injury to predict what might happen later. So, for example, um, if you have a particular cytokine that goes up within the first 24 hours and you're able to link that to a late effect, you might be able to tell the physician, listen, this guy's not showing lung injury yet, but he probably is going to need a lung approach pretty soon, and the earlier you can get it in, the better. So we call that predictive biodissymmetry. Um, we did, we've had focused funding in that particular area throughout the years. Um, we've also provided interagency agreement funding to our NCI colleagues and Food and Drug Administration colleagues. We did this pretty crazy study where we irradiated animals and took all kinds of samples, you name it. Sally remembers this. It was just, it was incredibly complex. And 12 laboratories received samples ranging from plasma, serum, urine, hair, uh, fecal samples, and they were able to look at these to see what the biomarkers were. We had both unirradiated and irradiated animals, and we feel like that's really been able to move this field forward. I'll talk also on the fact that those animals all went to Wake Forest after, so they were able to um, be a, a way for us to continue to monitor them, and we're considering another study um, in the next few years. So um, radionuclide decorporation and blocking, we, we spoke about how you can get radionuclides where they're not supposed to be internally, and uh, the chelators typically allow you to excrete those more quickly. 
there are licensed products, but the ones for um, plutonium, americium, and uranium are only intravenous. And so we've put an effort in to develop oral formulations of these compounds, which of course would be better for a concept of operations mass casualty use. Uh, the one that I'm going to discuss and we're very uh, pleased about is the HOPO compounds. Uh, they were um, early research funding from our program are currently now in a clinical trial where any day we're going to be dosing uh, the first patients. This is going to be a safety study. It's an oral compound. Um, we're going to be looking for um, pharmacokinetic um, data in the humans that would, we're hoping is going to be consistent with what's been seen in, in the preclinical models. Uh, it's in clinicaltrials.gov, and we've consented our first few patients. So we're excited to have that be an outcome of our work that we've done. We also, uh, and maybe this will resonate with people, is that uh, we, you have to understand the dose of radiation you're giving to a preclinical model. It's a problem in our field. So we have done what I think is leading the way to actually make sure that the radiation doses that are used across our portfolio are correct. Um, you have to be able to compare studies done at different labs. You want to be able to have a medical countermeasure tested in one model and another model, and we do encourage a lot of that collaboration. So generally, if you can get within 5% of the dose you're thinking you're putting in there, that's what sort of the gold standard is. And we found that the best way to do this was to award a single contract, and we've done that. And now other government agencies are reaching out and saying, hey, can we use that contract? Because we really like it that you're able to you know, make sure that the radiation doses are both precise and accurate. So previously, we had made um, investments across, for example, um, product development contract we had at University of Maryland. We participated and helped organize a meeting in 2011 um, with the National Institute of Standards and Technology and NCI. Um, we have a uh, large, um, large investment in what we call our Centers for Medical Countermeasures Against Radiation Consortium, or the CMCRC. They started out with a core to make sure the centers were in line, and then we had some more meetings and said, yeah, we really need to probably expand out this capability. So we gave the core a little more money to go across different parts of the program. And ultimately, that res resulted in the awarding of a contract in 2020, which is ongoing. It's um, at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, so far, more than 30 irradiators in our RNCP-funded portfolio have been evaluated. They've included X-ray and gamma ray sources. Uh, they do TLD dosimetry. Um, our contractor does field mapping. So make sure that your field is actually centered on where you're putting your samples. This has um, been a concern with some groups we've worked with. And they offer phantoms for all these different animal models. So they send out phantoms. Our awardees irradiate them, send them back, and we do sort of an evaluation. So this is just, don't look at the details. These are just maybe 30 different attempts with multiple irradiators across our program. And you can see here that some have come in very high, <laughs> much higher, some lower. You have ones that hit the sweet spot. Um, some of them don't hit it right away. But the nice thing about the program is that it's not just about identifying the problems, it's addressing them. So we're very proud of this effort and um, working with all of our partners to ensure that we're what we're doing is actually what we think we're doing. Um, I know I'm going at a very rapid pace. I want to make sure I get through these. Uh, we also have this late-term non-human primate radiation survivor colony we're very proud of. Um, what you're seeing here is actually a graphical representation, a snapshot, if you will, of the colony, um, where here we have animals that weren't irradiated up to animals that received over LD90 doses and survived. So these are very, these are unicorns, if you will. It was established in 2007. Um, currently, there are over 215 animals in this colony. Uh, it's about a $3 million a year investment on the part of NIID. The animals, um, at any point in time, we've had more than 300, but due to aging out and, and lethality, death, you know, late deaths, we, we, that number has gone down. They're fat and happy, eating a North American diet, watching Curious George and National Geographic. It's really tremendous. They, they, they're drawn to the monkeys on screens and TVs. And it, it's just an amazing um, resource. And these animals receive just top-notch care. Uh, again, we have animals that are age-matched that are not irradiated. We have males and females. Uh, the doses and the, the way they've been irradiated, we've got a lot of different models there. And we have animals that were treated with different drugs. So we're really able to go back and query these animals. We do routine assessments. That data is available. The samples are available to the research community. If you have this and 
you can click that link. It'll actually take you right to the, the website where you can make those requests. Um, and it also lets us do that kind of prognostic and predictive biosymmetry. Did we see something early on that led these animals to have a greater propensity for lung injury, for example? So it's a, a continuous resource. Um, we've seen some really surprising things happening in these animals that were unanticipated, high rates of diabetes, for example, um, some immune blind spots where they cannot process, uh, for example, vaccine the same way, um, vaccination strategies. Um, and they are tested annually. They're tested monthly. They're looked at daily. So there's a whole lot of things that we do not only to ensure their health and safety, but to make those kinds of data and samples available so others can try to better understand um, what's happening. I was asked to talk about the engagements with other agencies. We're part of the FEMC, so we love working with other groups. We hold scientific conferences, all these different groups. We publish meeting reports, again, agency overviews. We co-fund awards with these different groups, um, and uh, we also are, serve on working groups across government. So we're very heavily invested in the U.S. one government approach. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, meetings. <laughs> we also have 57 team publications. Just a couple are here. We're very proud of one that we put out on COVID-19 and how it's similar to radiation injury. So we were able to repurpose a lot of our approaches for COVID, uh, which has um, been very gratifying. Um, and we've also, since inception, uh, funded 58 different opportunities for funding throughout our program. So I, I realized it was a sprint, but I appreciate everyone's attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. This is our team, without whom none of this would have been possible. Um, they're, they're amazing to work with every day, and many of them are on the call. So thank you, everyone, and thank you especially to my team, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for presenting your research into an extremely complex problem. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, that was very helpful. Um, I actually have a question before we turn to the rest of the, the board and, and staff, mm -hmm. and it was sparked by one of the last things that you said in the comparison to dealing with COVID. Could you say a few more words about that? Right. So pretty early on, it became apparent that a lot of the strategies that we use, these antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, vascular-focused products, um, as the I would say it was probably like June or July, it became very apparent that those are the kinds of things that COVID tended to be concentrating on. We were seeing a lot of symptoms that were very similar to what we knew to follow from radiation exposures, right? So there was ischemic stresses. There were, um, there were problems, uh, for example, with... Uh, blood vessel patency, uh, the, the idea that the cardiovascular was implicated, the brain fog and everything. So uh, um, one of the people on our team, Dr. Carmen Rios, we worked together to try to let's really read up on the literature and see what connections we can make. So we were able to do that. Uh, that paper was published in Radiation Research. We're very proud. It's still the most downloaded, most read paper um, re of recent times. And so I think that we also were also we we're trying to encourage our research community to expand their thinking in terms of maybe we can repurpose things we've been doing and apply them to the, the radiation research space. So we did actually have several uh, wardies pivot and begin doing COVID work. In fact, we still have a clinical trial um, from one of these uh, radiation-focused medical countermeasures that's now uh, being tested for uh, late lung fibrosis from COVID. So, yeah, I think that we, we, and I think many people believe that because COVID is a vascular disease that just happens to get in through your respiratory tract, that there's a lot of things that are overlapping in terms of the way it causes injury and ways you may approach that injury to try to mitigate it. Um, so things like lung fibrosis were a, a a perfect match, we thought, to the kind of stuff that we funded through our program and also some of the cardiovascular and the CNS work. Fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions from either in the room or online? Charles? Wow. Uh, Andy, it's what, such a fascinating talk. It was just mind expanding. Uh, one of the uh, newer areas that the board and staff have been talking about this meeting in a closed session earlier and then our previous meeting a few months ago, beginning of the year. And it's not going to surprise you, but, you know, AI and machine learning, mm -hmm. you know, those, those technologies, of course, almost every sector imaginable is now trying to think about how to apply AI and machine learning. Um, are, you know, you and your research teams, are you 
thinking about those tools, especially kind Absolutely. of like searching for, yeah. It's like you, you teed that one up right for, right for me. In fact, we're having a meeting this summer that's open on advanced technologies. And, and one of the parts of that meeting is going to be on data mining and using sort of these um, AI techniques and where they can be brought to bear on some of the, for example, huge volumes of data that are being generated in all of our omics approaches. Uh, we've had really fun conversations about how chat GPT could be um, taken into our, our program and what it might be able to provide in a way of a really neat tool. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely something we're trying to stay cutting edge and understand that. Um, other cutting edge areas we're looking at are things like um, um, human on a chip technologies. For example, we recently co-funded some work with NASA to develop some of these chip technologies. We think that's the direction it's going in, minimizing animal use and really being able to access human tissues in that way. That's very exciting. Um, and we, we, we have a lot of things that are, um, I don't want to say ARPA-esque, but we have a lot of aspects of our program that are, you know, sort of R21 level, maybe higher risk, but really exciting things happening. And we're going to try to highlight those during the meeting that we have this summer. But definitely uh, there's a lot of data that needs to be assessed across especially the biomarkers part of our program, and we are looking for those kinds of techniques to come to the forefront and help us in that. Very fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Zoom is being weird. Um, <laughs> so you, <laughs> I know it, there's something else weird going on. Um, so you, when we go back to COVID, and some other topics that come with come up often with our nuclear studies is communication. Mm -hmm. And so, and you like you, one of your first slides is you need to be in there within 24 hours. Yes. Are you teaming with somebody, or do you have plans on how to communicate a positive message that? You're the good guys and not the bad guys? <laughs> yeah, so we're not the leads in that effort, but we are involved. And uh, those kinds of communication-type activities tend to be within, in residence, I call them, within Health and Human Services. So the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, we have working groups, we have guidance documents. Um, we're always putting together what the requirements might look like. Um, you know, there's, there's concerns about for example, limiting first responder exposures. You you know that first responders, uh, by large, you know, by in large, tend to be the kind of people that are just going to run towards danger, right? So, how do we ensure their safety while they're going into these potentially contaminated areas? So, yeah, messaging is very important. Um, a lot of that has occurred, for example, at the state and local levels. There's this fantastic um, YouTube video to go look up. Um, get inside, stay inside, stay tuned, right? So that's the that's the messaging. If something happens, a lot of the things that are going on go into basements, go into the lowest level of your house. Um, make sure that you are um, sheltering in place and not racing out because, you know, in, in a, the short time post-exposure, you're going to have a lot of injuries and a lot of potential for even further damage if you're not smart about it. So, um, you know, having personally gone through 9-11 working in D.C., what's the first thing I did? I hopped in the car and I drove home, right? So if something happens with radiation, I hope I have the good sense to take a step back and say, no, I need to stay put for now. So a lot of that messaging, um, a lot of the concerns that go beyond, for example, medical, so the psychological impacts, those are all being considered at sort of different levels. We're really tasked with, let's get the drugs developed. Let's bring our awardees, their, their amazing scientific discoveries forward and try to get things approved and available if we need them. But yeah, those kinds of activities are definitely happening at other levels of government. And there's a lot of guidance documents out there as well that I can probably provide if you would be interested. Yeah. I have another question for you. Um, but <laughs> I before I ask it, I'll remind the participants mm -hmm. that um, the Q&A session is for board members and, and National Academy staff. So, and mm -hmm. I admit this is a, um, a naive question. Mm -hmm. um, my area of expertise lies outside the, the medical world. Um, sure. But it strikes me that your uh, discovery of of similarities between radiation exposure and COVID was somewhat of a felicitous one. Um, and is is there hope that that could lead to broader breakthroughs beyond either COVID or radiation treatment? Um, I, I'm not sure that we have continued investments in, in trying to, um, so, you know, a lot of the COVID investments have sort of tailed off, 
right? So, so we don't have continued investments. I'd like to think that the work we do isn't siloed into only meaning a radiation use. Um, and in the same way that I think early on we, we stole liberally from the oncology space, NCI, uh, we were very early um, begging them for, you know, what are you guys using? What are you working on? I'd like to think it's more of a two-way street now that some of the stuff we're developing, we actually send uh, companies and groups that are interested over to NCI and say, maybe this could work for them too. So I think um, in terms of COVID, I, I'm not sure that the research dollars or the emphasis are there currently, but we do have um, work that we funded particularly some interesting work that we were finding on early biomarkers. This, these, these groups went out and identified early biomarkers of COVID that predict late, um, late expectations in terms of response. So since some of that has sort of died down, I'm not sure how um, continued either the funding or the research will be, but it's something that we definitely um, are still supporting. Great. Thank you. Charles? Yeah, Andy, I was thinking about, um, I mean, I thought in the U.S. you're, you're coordinating with multiple agencies because there are a lot to have, mm -hmm. you know, stake in this complex issue set. I can't remember if you talked much, maybe we, you know, we still have, you know, time in this session, but to talk a bit about um, work with international partners, other countries, sure. and how does that coordination happen, um, where are there differences, how do you harmonize Mm -hmm. um, you know, also trying to think about uh, areas where potentially you know, but our board could be helpful in terms of thinking about, you know, the globe and sure. how to coordinate those efforts. Absolutely. Um, great question. So we do have an international uh, footprint, I would say. Uh, it's uh, in recent years, I've been trying to expand that. We are uh, part of the Radiation Emergency Medical, Medical Preparedness Action Network, REMPAN, which is a, a group that's sponsored by the World Health Organization. So uh, we have a lot of interactions uh, with other countries th through the WHO. I had the distinct honor of serving on a consultancy panel for trying to advise uh, international other countries who may not have stockpiles. We recently put together a guidance document that the World Health um, Organization actually put out. So, so we've worked with that. We've also uh, recently been working more closely with uh, colleagues at the IRSN in France uh, who, who have um, a lot of radiation associated responsibilities in the country. They do research, they do response. Uh, so we've been working closely with them. Um, in fact, colleagues in Germany said, hey, what you're doing with France, we want to get in on that too. Maybe we can develop something similar with you. So we've, we've been trying to expand that out. We've worked very well with our Canadian neighbors. They have a lot of things actually figured out pretty well, especially in the area of determination of dose, and they have a network across Canada that we're trying to see if we can work with them and, and see how their network's set up and see if we can get similar things going in the U.S. And I think some of the more obvious things are interactions with the Radi Radiation Effects Research Foundation in Hiroshima. Um, so we had funded them to do some very valuable studies um, using their human patients, their human samples that they have, which, um, and their ongoing uh, association with people who are survivors from, from those um, events, trying to look at what their immune responses look like and work with researchers there. So uh, we're always looking to make those kinds of uh, collaborations. And if you can help us make those stronger or make new ones, I think that's definitely something that we as a team would be interested in because uh, a lot of groups I, I'm learning are really looking to the U.S. and they're saying, we're going to let the U.S. figure this out. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, you've got drugs licensed. Okay, maybe we will uh, provide some kind of a, a accessibility to those products or maybe you've been able to develop some uh, markers. Um, that's not to say that we're leading the way scientifically. I just think in terms of the actual how we would put this stuff into place is where I think that we're having a major role. And of course, amazing research is going on all over the all over the globe um, that's propelling the entire field forward. Mike, did you have a question? I, your hand went up and then down. There were some hands the, on the Zoom that went up and down, too. Uh, yeah. Um, it a, maybe it's a sidebar question. So you work okay. with and the National Cancer Institute. Yeah. And some of the drugs I saw, I think, were like, I, all, I, all I know, maybe the Amgen drug yes. was derived for people yes. with chemotherapy. Yes. In fact, uh, Three of the four came right out of the oncology space. So I was just wondering if, it, if there's thought about going full circle um, and using some of the countermeasures you're thinking about and helping cancer patients that are receiving 
radiotherapy. That would be great, yes. Okay. And also chemotherapy, which causes okay. similar myelosuppression. So, yes, and in, in fact, when we come across a company that we think, hey, you know, your drug works great ahead of time, maybe not so great afterwards, maybe you should be talking to NCI. But NCI has a, a tremendously large program where they're always looking um, and interfacing with the research community. I think it's unlikely we'll find something that they didn't already know about, but we do try to do that, that cross-pollination with the NCI space. Um, the M-plate product that you saw is actually um, for um, idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenia. So it's for people who have, um, you know, they can't understand maybe the, the reasons why they have platelet loss, but it, that came out of the hematology community. Um, the things like ACE inhibitors that we're studying have come out of, you know, cardiovascular, all different communities. So um, all, that's not to say that we don't have very interesting novel approaches that are being developed in early stages and some that are even reaching the point where they're starting to talk to the regulatory agencies about moving them forward. So we do have, uh, we have them across the entire spectrum. We have things that are very early, very exciting, and then we have things that have a lot more um, data to support their use. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your, your presentation and your – oh, Charles, did you have another word? Oh, sure. <laughs> I know. I, we still have some more time, and I think okay. – <laughs> no, Oh, wait. Oh, you, Mel, you, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, weird. Yeah, I don't but remember the stop time. I was time. listening to what, what, what okay, Andrew I gave was saying. I'm discussion. thinking about, like uh, – and also the, the study, you know, Mike's working on with Madeline and Ellie and WMD. I would love nuclear, to learn more about the work. Absolutely, so. Yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, you know, we'll wish them luck in getting their report through review. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, and, and, <laughs> well, we'll get it written. That's the next step. We next, write twenty four seven, so I hear yeah, you. Yeah, we on know that. the that's next next month or two. That's the critical together. time. But anyway, I was thinking about things like stockpiling and mm -hmm. uh, strategic areas. You, you mentioned, you know, with civilian populations, mm -hmm. you, you're not going to. It's not unlike you know, if you're in the military, you could take it ahead of time, potentially, if you're going to go into an emergency situation. But civilian populations, as you said, probably greater than 24 hours yes. after the event. So, but Even then, later would be better. You, but yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But I'm thinking about, but you don't want to wait probably too long. Um, Some of our lung drugs, we've shown preclinically, you can give them weeks later, and they're still effective. I mean, your window of, of where you can have an impact is really short for GI oh. and heme, right? Because the damage is so devastating early on, uh, so you have short windows. But things like lung and kidney, maybe you can come in weeks later. But yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, so. yeah, that was, that was kind of one of my questions. But then I thought about, I thought it may be even more urgent, you know, you want to get it really deliver quickly. So then in terms of like stockpiling it in parts of the country, mm -hmm. you may want the um, multiple stockpiles kind of evenly distributed. Well, not maybe not so evenly distributed, but close to population centers. Yeah. yeah. So um, technically the location of the stockpiles is a tightly held. Right. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to use the bullshit. And, and we don't get involved in the stockpiling at all. Okay. And those kinds of um, specific details, I would recommend that you invite our colleagues um, at the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response to come and brief you because they can give you a lot more um, details about how stockpiling works. And But the idea is that every uh, stockpile that you have them situated across the country so that within 24 hours you could mobilize and get something. Okay. Um, you know, with 9-11, I think we also found that you don't, you can't, maybe we're not going to have airplanes. Maybe we're going to have to consider. So I think that the idea is that you can move them. Mm -hmm. um, of course, if we have a large scale incident, you may not be able to, you may be able to get them to the periphery of the city, but how do we get them in? So there's all kinds mm. of what they call con ops or concept of operations. And so those feed into the requirements that we have to give to our researchers. So, you know, it'd be lovely if, if your drug was amazing, but you had to give it 15 minutes after radiation. Yeah. That might work if some people happen to have a problem when they're at a hospital. But, you know, in these other settings, it's really more difficult. Mm -hmm. And not only do you have to give the drug at that time frame, you have to be able to assess the injury first, right? Yeah. So some of the things we're looking for, we're hoping will take minutes to hours. Our gold standard takes days. Mm. So if you lose time, even just getting the, to the victim of the incident, and then you have to wait to know who, you know, if it's not obvious. I mean, I think some things are going to be obvious, but whether you've received a radiation exposure at this point in time is going to look like how long did it take for you to vomit, mm. right? So that's a known prodromal symptom of radiation exposure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, honestly, if my neighbor 
is vomiting, I'm probably vomiting, right? So those are really um, difficult measures in, in these kinds of anticipated emergency situations to rely on. Um, things like lymphocyte depletion. So your lymphocyte counts are known to be a particular baseline. And if you see them going down serially, you know, someone's got a bit, gotten a big exposure, but these things take time. So uh, if you can come in early, that's great. We just don't anticipate that that's going to meet a large scale incident. Um, but for now, if there's individual exposures, I certainly think that the healthcare community is very equipped to be able to deal with them rapidly. Mm-hmm. You know, tens of tens of people. That's certainly something that they're they can jump into right away. Yeah, but on those lines, I mean, you mentioned earlier in your talk about lymphonenco, and you know, I've done some study of that case. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that was an individual, obviously, and it took a while to diagnose the problem. For a while, they thought it was thallium poisoning. Yes. And because it had very similar um, symptoms, but um, and as you said, right? Yeah. So we are we are relying, and there are efforts in place to really make sure that uh, physicians are able to identify these kinds of injuries when they come up. What we've seen most mostly, what's been seen in humans has been cutaneous exposures. Right? Uh, radiation sources are all over the place. I don't think people recognize that. There's a lot of industrial use of them, um, especially in, for example, determining if concrete is appropriately cured. So you see these, you hear about these things bouncing off the back of trucks in Australia. They found it. It's amazing. I'm just talking about things that are very very small. Um, but people sometimes pick them up, they put them in their pocket. They, the most recent human exposures have been primarily cutaneous um, industrial accident type in, in situations. And so we know a lot about those kinds of exposures and how those are treated. And those are very individual cases. So those people get very intensive care, um, which usually occurs in, in Paris, actually, the Percy Hospital and Military Hospital in Paris has a lot of these international cases that come in. So we've seen a lot of those kinds of exposures. Um, and those people do receive intensive care, um, but then you know when you when you're talking about something that which the, you can go online, it's very sobering to look at the numbers that could result from the kinds of nu- nuclear detonations we anticipate. But what I like to add is that not everyone. I mean, if you're if you live in outside the Beltway, for example, if you know the D.C. area, you're probably okay if you stay in your house and don't wander out into a potential fallout plume, right? So these are very survivable events. And unfortunately, most of the people who are getting the super high doses are going to be impacted by other things you have in an urban environment, uh, fireballs, overpressures, you know, glass shattering, buildings falling on people, right? So those kinds of big events the people who are right in the core, there's not a lot that can be done for them. And the people that are way outside, they're probably fine. But there is a sort of a, a band, um, if you're looking at sort of when you think about those Hiroshima maps, you've got the hypocenter and you've got the band. So there are bands where a government-provided uh, medical response can save lives. And so that's, you know, what we, what, that's what our mission is. I know our team thinks about this every day. You know, what are we doing today that's moving this field forward so that we can get to the point where we're able to save more people? should something happen. So it's not, I don't want people to think it's all doom and gloom. The government is making appropriate investments. These are cross-government. As I mentioned, NASA's concerned about their astronauts. They're investing in radiation. DOD is concerned about their troops. So there are a lot of, um, it's a small research community, but we are well linked. And so we do try to leverage investments across all of them. So I think, I think we're making nice progress. So that's why I sleep well. Okay. At night. Yeah. Madeline, did you have a question? I had a quick one. Um, so I'm I'm fascinated by your goal of having sort of the COVID equivalent of a of a tester, mm-hmm. right? That people could could use. Um, but tell me how you're thinking about the conops for that, because with a with a COVID tester, it's very binary. Yeah, you yes. have it. Yes, I have it. No, I yes. don't. Right? It's, right. It's you got the two lines, or you don't. Mm-hmm. But on something for a radiation detector, it, it, yes or no may or may not be meaningful. Right. Yes, I have some exposure, but it's really <laughs> And that's why nothing is care, simple, right? right? You know? yeah. Or yes, I have it and it's really high and yes. I'm, but I'm going to care a lot. This is, so this how do is you definitely think about complicated. And that? I think that the current uh, approach has not been you have a test kit at home. The current approach has been that you have um, what they call field field. You can put things out in the field. They can be in a gymnasium that's a, a triage center. Um, and those are yes, no type questions, right? Did you get exposed or not? And I think there are requirements for how quickly those answers have to come and how reliable they have to be. So that's kind of like what I would call field care. And then there's definitive care. So you've identified someone who clearly is 
is has been exposed, right? Some of that's going to depend on their what we know of their location and where things were happening. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. And those people then we try to take that next step and say, okay, how much of an exposure did you receive? So there are different requirements for something that's a, sort of a hospital-based assay as opposed to a field-based assay. And I don't think right now we're thinking that you're going to have a home-based assay because I think the idea is this is a boom, it happens kind of thing. And, and hopefully, if it does, it's not all over, happening in different cities all at the same time. You know, these are things that we worry about. Um, and so, but it's going to, you're going to know exactly when that event happened. And then the timeline starts for everybody from there. So it's not like you're going to later develop a radiation exposure complication, um, you know, maybe three days later. You're probably not going to be exposed to radiation three days later unless you are um, ignoring public health guidance about not going out of your house, for example. Um, so the idea is, is that you probably won't need a home test, mm -hmm. uh, but you will need something that you can go to a triage location. You can go to your physician. Maybe your physician is going to have some kind of access. And we have been trying to leverage, for example, existing laboratory uh, requirements and capabilities. So, uh, for example, the funding we've provided at Columbia University in specific for their work on biodisymmetry has said, listen, can we work with Quest or these other places that already process samples all the time. And maybe you'd be able to go to your doctor and your doctor could very quickly do an assay, send it off, get a result, right? So that's, we're trying to leverage what's already there. And I think we learned a lot of lessons from COVID about ways to make that more effective um, and to make it faster and to make it, you know, better, faster, um, in, in the general sense, like we've seen with what happened with COVID. I think also the, the, the population understands emergency use authorization, which when we would say EUA, faces would glaze. People understand a lot more about how things happen. The, the FDA is not so much the black box, it, not to use a pun, but it's not so much behind the curtain. People really understand how the FDA functions now. And I think that benefits both uh, both people who could be involved in this kind of incident who are like, oh my gosh, something may have happened. I at least realize that there could be a, an impact that I need to be concerned about. And also the, those individuals developing these approaches and identifying these, these biomarkers of injury. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. DiCarlo. That was fascinating. Thank um, you. We, um, we now have a five minute break. We will return at uh, 10 to the hour. Yep. And if anybody has any questions, you can uh, type in HHS directory and put in my name and you can find us and reach out with questions. Happy to answer those. Thank you again. All right, we're back in session now. Um, we will now have a presentation on updates on the waste isolation pilot plant from Ms. Betsy Fornash, who is the Acting Deputy Director of the Carlsbad Field Office of the United States Department of Energy. Good afternoon, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Betsy, thank you. Okay, very good, I feel like I've talked to you guys a couple of times over the last few years, and every time I talk to you, I have a different title, so. <laughs> Um, at the moment, it's the acting um, director at our Carlsbad field office, which oversees uh, the WIP. So wanted to give you a quick update on um, what we've been doing, what we're looking forward to doing, and you know where we see um, issues and opportunities. Next slide, please. So I just want to underscore, uh, I think it's something you all already appreciate, but you know, WIP is just so central to um, the EM mission. If you look at our 2023 um, calendar year priorities or go back and look at the past couple of years, you'll see that there are WIP actions that um, appear really prominently in the priorities um, in a direct way. So for example, this year making progress on our ventilation system and utility shaft, um, shipments from um, different sites are explicitly identified, but having WIP operational and efficient also underlies the ability to achieve, um, you know, commitments and um, regulatory milestones across a number of sites. So um, even where you don't see it explicitly, it, it's part of the picture for um, a number of other priorities. Next, please. Thanks. Um, 
a few minutes to talk about what we've been um, doing and accomplished um, in the recent past. So um, in calendar year 2022, we received almost 300 shipments, true way shipments from across the complex. Um, that includes about 75 from um, Los Alamos in New Mexico, which is a high priority for us. We completed waste emplacement in panel seven and began emplacement in panel eight. So we've actually um, just this week um, completed our certification to state that the full panel closure system is in place for panel seven. So that's official um, that it's closed now. This transition is really important to us because um, panel seven, we still were dealing with contamination issues from the 2014 incidents. So uh, workers were in PPE. There were some restrictions on um, access and um, operations there. In panel eight, we are out of the zone where there was contamination. And so um, we don't have to have the same level of PPE and the complexities and the operations. We're back you know, to the normal um, clean mode of operation for WIP, which makes a big difference for us. We are um, making progress also towards mining out additional drifts that will provide access to the new West Wing, um, where we have replacement panels 11 and 12. And that was a priority for us that we identified in 2022. So as a reminder, panels 11 and 12 are um, replacement panels for um, space that was lost due to the, um, the 2014 incident. So that was some space in panel seven, as well as uh, the drifts in between the existing panels that had originally been identified um, as potential locations um, for waste that we refer to that as panels nine and 10. That's why you have a discontinuity in the numbers. We've completed installation of salt reduction units for the new safety significant confinement ventilation system. That's a mouthful, I know. Um, but a reminder, this we have two um, two different parts of this new ventilation system. So um, one is a salt reduction facility um, that would be the first step in um, you know, with air movement out. And the second one is um, a HEPA filtration building. I think it's um, six different banks of um, filters that go through. So, um, and either, I mean, the what this provides us is the capability to work on full HEPA filtered ventilation um, in a, to a level that will support simultaneous operations of mining and waste emplacement. So um, at the moment, we have um, separate ventilation um, pathways and fans that we use for doing um, mining un, unfiltered and waste emplacement filtered. This will allow us to do both of them at the same time. And the configuration will actually allow us to use um, either the salt reduction facility on its own or the HEPA filtration on its own or um, both as we um, as we might need. In terms of the utility shaft, um, we've excavated um, as of the end of last year to the 1300 foot level. This is going to go all the way down to 2150 feet, which is the level of um, waste emplacement, and it will serve, it will hook into the West Wing um, where the new panels 11 and 12 are, um, and it's also going to serve as the intake shaft um, for the, uh, to hook into the new ventilation system. I think um, as of last year, we were at 1300 feet. I think now we're almost down to um, 1800 feet in that, um, in the drilling for that. We've safely transported um, 16 million cumulative miles. That's loaded miles, not, not just uh, truck miles, but uh, waste miles. And we're really proud of that safety record. And we have recently completed a transition to a new MO contractor at WIP that is Simcoe um, transitioning from a nuclear waste partnership that had held the contract for the last um, few years. So um, we're really pleased with how that transition has gone. Next, please. 
All right, so uh, moving on to you know what we're working on now and looking forward um, in terms of WIP and True Ways. The, the first thing is just, of course, a, a comprehensive um, look at not just the WIP, but at the generator sites, at the processes we use to certify waste, um, to prioritize and schedule, you know, what waste is coming from where so that um, so that we're meeting commitments across the board. We, we have um, had some challenges with the availability of commodities, um, like um, some of the, the overpack containers, the standard waste boxes. Um, so that's something that we are paying attention to. And then looking more closely at sharing lessons learned across the site. We're seeing, for example, that um, at the Idaho site, we have some challenges um, with aging you know, aging drums and, and how they fare um, in terms of container integrity and shipping. And so we want to make sure, you know, if we're seeing that at one site, that other sites are aware of what's happening and um, what we can do to alleviate any concerns or issues. We are continuing to work on a path forward for the land waste that is at waste control specialists. Um, this was waste that was shipped there um, to complete a, um, a commitment to the state when the first incidents happened at WIP in 2014. Um, and then unfortunately we realized that some of the drums there um, have similar um, components and compatibility issues. Um, to the drums that, and the waste stream that were implicated in the WIP incident. So we have actually been able to move um, a significant uh, fraction of the waste out of there, but we still have a number of um, containers that have record codes on them. And we've been looking at um, options for how we how we might be able to remove those codes, either by looking uh, more carefully at the current condition of the waste rather than the condition when those codes um, were assigned and, um, and potential treatment options as well. So um, the state of Texas is really um, interested in having us make progress on that. So it's also a high priority. Surplus plutonium disposition. Um, I know the Academy has had a longstanding interest in this. So um, operations, the downblending operations at Savannah River have been ongoing and we have accepted uh, the first shipments of um, surplus plutonium at the whip from those operations. So it still is, I would say a deliberate and um, not speedy process at the moment. Um, we're looking at maybe one shipment a month coming from um, Savannah River to WIP on that. Next, please. We have a number of really important regulatory activities that are happening um, now or in the foreseeable future. So. First, we are in the midst of a process to renew our RICRA permit with the New Mexico Environment Department. Um, they published a draft permit at the end of last year. The comment period, the public comment period on the draft permit closes tomorrow. Um, so we, we will be submitting comments. Um, they had a number of uh, changes and new conditions that were proposed. Um, some of them would pose operational challenges for us. Some of them would pose um, legal challenges or um, for us. So we'll be submitting a combination of comments, but um, expecting that we'll be having, you know, negotiations with the state to try to resolve those differences um, and alleviate the need for a hearing or. Um, later in the process. EPA, we're also due for our periodic five-year recertification. So they just finalized the decision on our 2019 submittal um, last fall, um, but we already are in the cycle to finalize, uh, conduct the uh, performance assessment and finalize the application and documentation for our submittal in March of 2024. So 
Um, there are still a few technical issues that were raised in the 2022 decision. Um, and we also are looking at um, if or how um, the modeling would reflect future panels. Again, we are looking um, at getting permission for panels 11 and 12. You see them pointed out on the schematic. Like I said, that's the, the new wing out to the west. Um, if you look um, partway down on the arrow that points to panel 11, you'll see that shaft number five. Uh, that is the new utility shaft. That's the, the air intake that will be serving it. That's the one that we're in the midst of drilling. So. Um, the New Mexico Environment Department has wrapped the permissions for panel 11 and 12. Um, we had submitted that as a permit modification and they have wrapped that decision into the permit renewal process. For EPA, we have yet to submit a plan change request to them on 11 and 12, but we are aiming um, to do that later this year. And they, they, they'll they need to do an evaluation of um, whether it can be um, considered um, as a plan change or whether there might need to be a rulemaking on that. And then lastly, again, progress on the capital asset projects um, and mining. Um, that's the ventilation system, the utility shaft, and, and those are all important for being able to gain access to pan panels 11 and 12, um, which will give us continuity. We're, you know, we really, what we really want to avoid is a situation where we have panel eight filled and we have panels 11 and 12 um, not yet available um, either physically from a mining perspective or, you know, regulatorily from uh, an authorization perspective from NMED or EPA. So that's, you know, that's what we're working towards. If you look, you know, right now with um, going into panel eight, we are about a little over 40% um, into the allowed maximum capacity of WIP under the Land Withdrawal Act. So um, if you do the calculation, you can project out that, and you look at our projected waste inventories, you can project out that panels 11 and 12 um, on their own will also not get us fully to a Land Withdrawal Act volume. So um, we are looking at, um, you know, what more will be needed in that regard, and that those will be wrapped in um, future plans, NEPA analysis, and um, regulatory submittals. Next, please. So I guess what I want to end with is, um, you know, we're, we're proud of what we've been what we've been doing, um, we think there are good opportunities um, with the a new contractor in place. With what we've learned um, over time, we're taking steps now to make sure that you know uh, to to rebuild, that recapitalize our infrastructure to build the new ventilation system and utility shaft um, that will support WIP being able to fully uh, meet its mission. But I would say, you know, to really support that. Um, moving forward, there are a few things that we need to pay particular attention to. So um, one is that we need to strengthen our community and regulatory relationship. So if you've seen Ike Waite speak um, recently, he's really emphasized the importance of alignment. Um, and I think that's really about aligning our objectives with um, regulatory requirements with community needs, with state interests and um, perspectives and being able to balance that, you know, not just across a site um, or a waste stream, but to balance that, um, you know, across the state, across multiple states um, to make sure that we're meeting all of the objectives. Um, New Mexico is an absolutely crucial partner for us. Um, so, you know, we are working closely with them on the permit to make sure that we can craft something that um, is implementable and realistic, but recognizes their their particular needs. Um, and I would just say Carlsbad is an incredibly supportive host community and we wanna make sure that, 
we maintain um, that relationship as well. I, I mean, I have to say from, you know, coming out here, um, it's one thing to hear people say and to see from DC that um, Carlsbad is supportive of it, but um, coming out here and seeing it in person, um, it's, it's really incredible to see the, the level of engagement and support out here. So we definitely don't wanna lose that. Um, I would just say, you know, we, uh, we are looking at, um, you know, we're looking at increasing our efficiency, and I think there are there are a few different dimensions to it. I mean, one is that moving into panel eight really kind of automatically increases our efficiency for the reasons that I already talked about. But we need to make sure that that you know, if we're able to do that, then everything else that supports. Um, you know, waste and placement and that feeds into it also is being done um, transparently and safely um, if we're going to be increasing the pace. So that's mining, ground control, worker awareness, the availability of the supporting commodities um, and supply chain and um, and waste certification, right? I mean, being able to emplace waste does us no good if we don't have waste that's filling the um, pipeline. So um, I mentioned a couple of challenges already that, that we see in front of us. One of those is supply chain issues. Another one is aging waste. And um, a third one is, you know, that we are kind of down to smaller and more difficult um, waste streams and getting the process knowledge um, to support characterization for those, especially legacy waste streams, um, can be really challenging. And you know, the, the issue that we're dealing with is it's almost the same amount of effort to do it, no matter what the size of the waste stream is, but it's harder, you know, it sort of gets progressively harder and harder to manage those resources when the payoff that we're getting at the end is a much smaller um, waste stream. So I think what that's doing is driving us to take a step back um, and think a little bit more creatively about how we can, you know, how we can address it. Um, it it never means that we do it at the cost of sacrificing safety, but I think it means that we need to question the status quo and go back and re-examine how we're doing things and figure out what really is contributing to safety. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, are the challenges that we faced when we put requirements in place still there or have they re evolved over time? Are the approaches that we're taking, um, are they working for us? Are they providing the safety and meeting the objectives that we've laid out? Are we talking about what we've learned and applying it across our sites and across our program to make a difference? And you know, what is our risk tolerance? And is it the same as it was? Um, or has it also evolved? So I think that's what we're that's what we're looking at. There are some ideas that are emerging um, that we think can help us to um, be a little bit more creative. One of them is um, centralized purchasing, which we already have, but looking at different distribution and allocation um, schemes to make sure that we're getting the resources to the sites, um, the generator sites that need them when they need them. Um, we're considering mobile certification capacity for smaller sites or that we might be able to bring um, search capacity to bigger programs, um, taking measures to mitigate uncertainties and legacy waste and aging containers. So most obvious example would be overpacking some containers um, that just takes the, you know, it, it, it requires commodities, but it takes some burden off of your, uh, you know, integrity inspections and such. Um, so I would say, you know, these these are not decisions that have been made, but they're the kinds of things that we're trying to think about and we're able to make sure that um, moving forward, we're able to keep the pipeline full, we're able to continue in placing safely, um, and we're able to do it hopefully more efficiently, but not at the cost of safety. So I'd be glad to take some questions if there are any. Thank you very much for a very informative discussion. More importantly, thank you for running a successful program in an area that is otherwise pretty fraught. Um, we'll turn to questions from uh, the board and, and academy staff. Allison, you, you're first again. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and thanks, Betsy. And Not at I'm all. I'm sorry if I missed 
some of you, what you said, I was driving and I had you on my phone on this on Zoom. Um, anyway, what we can do these days, right? Um, so, uh, so my question has to do with, you know, I can't believe it's almost 10 years since, um, since the accident in 2014. Wow, <laughs> where did that go? Um, but anyway, I wanted to hear more about what um, mechanisms that you have in place to ensure that doesn't happen again, to ensure that, you know, organic materials are not put in these, um, these canisters, et cetera. Um, we, well, there, I mean, we have the measures in place that were put in place when we reopened, when we restarted after the accident. So, you know, there were significant changes that we made to the waste acceptance criteria and the waste certification um, process. And it was, um, you know, partly about, uh, well, I would say probably less about the physical characterizations that we do in terms of, you um, you know, RTR or things like that, um, and uh, but put a lot of emphasis on a demonstration of um, chemical compatibility. Uh, and so the, those requirements are all still in place. We had um, much more documentation that was, was required on the, um, the process knowledge, um, potential chemicals um, that could be in the waste streams. Um, we also put, you know, we, we put in place some, um, requirements called generator site technical reviews. Um, and that was, the, those are intended to look not at the waste certification directly, but at the upstream processes at generator sites to, um, in terms of waste generation, waste packaging, um, and some on, on documentation. And, and that was really meant to, and sort of meant to do a couple of things. I mean, one is it's just meant to increase awareness <laughs> at the generator side because the people who are generating, you know, especially if you're, you know, Office of Science and, you know, these are new generation waste when we're looking upstream a lot of times. And there are opportunities there to make improvements that can really help us downstream. And, you know, if depending on how, you know, if you can video things, if you can document your process knowledge differently, that can really simplify it. So it's meant to encourage that. It was also, I think, a recognition of the fact that, you know, if you look at what happened in Los Alamos, right, the workers knew there were issues. I mean, they, they identified them and that, you know, but that did not alleviate the problem. And so part of what we do with this, I think is, you know, kind of empowering, providing that message to like empower people, <laughs> you know, in the, it's in the process. It's a safety culture issue. People, you know, yeah, from exactly. a regulatory perspective, I would say it's a safety culture issue and that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that needs exactly. And so that's another part of what, um, you know, what that process is meant to do. So that can, that continues um, as well. So we're, and, we're continuing all, all of those. I, you know, I, but I do think, you know, like I said, I, you know, we had a huge amount of, um, you know, discomfort and a need for reassurance when we were doing the restart at web, uh, you know, totally understandable and justifiable. And, you know, we accept that that was what we needed to do to, um, to be able to restart. But I think, you know, we, we did a lot of belt and suspenders things in our DSA, <laughs> for example, when we were doing restart. And, and, you know, that's something that I think we are going back and taking a look at, you know, are they really, you know, I, yeah, we have a track record again for being able to do waste and placement. And we want to go back and look at the things that we're putting in there really meaningful in terms of the payoff that they're giving us, especially if they're making for more complex operations that, you know, engender other risks in terms of, you know, worker safety or leaving winger at sites and things like that. So that's part of the balance that we're trying to re-examine now. And are, are there, are you, you know, from my point of view as a former NRC person, are you guys doing more regular inspections? You know, it seemed to me that that was a, that was an oversight, an area of missed oversight, that there weren't regular inspections being done of the packaging of these materials, et cetera. 
We do. I mean, we have requirements to go out and do annual recertifications um, at the waste generator sites and look at their operations. So um, we, we continue to do that. The um, EPA and the NMED both um, are able to participate in those as well. Um, so we're continuing to do that. Um, Oh shoot, I just had something else on the side of my mind that it went out <laughs> of my mind in that 10 seconds. But yes, we, we are continuing to, um, to do those. Okay, great, thank you, thanks. Yep. Charles? <clears throat> yeah, Betsy, thank you very much. That was a really excellent presentation. And like Allison, I wanna congratulate you and your team. You know, to state the obvious, uh, you know, WIP is um, the only you know, deep geologic repository that's operating in the world. So thinking about relationships, and I know that the Carlsbad community is very supportive of, of WIP and, and that, and I don't know if you caught Paul Black's presentation at the beginning of our open session, but Paul mentioned that, and he said that, you know, it really boils down to values. You know, what do, what what do the, the community what do they value what do the people community really want what are their the, what are their goals and he talked about it in terms of structured decision making and he said one of the main reasons why we have WIP operating is because you have such strong support from the community so other communities I've been thinking of and I asked our previous uh, speaker a question about international partnerships and and you know international. Um, um, uh, counterparts and interests, you know, Dr. DiCarlo's work and her team with radioactive uh, you know, uh, medical countermeasures and dealing with radioactive emergencies. But I think, um, you know, WIP is such an outstanding example, and especially thinking about what the conversation you just had with Allison, you know, lessons learned from the 2014 incident. Are you, are you hosting, are you, are you having, you know, people from other countries come to WIP or talk to you and your colleagues and try and understand how they can apply uh, those lessons in terms of risk management and putting in place safety measures and how to recover from an event like that and then get back to successful type of operations. So that's kind of my first question area. And the second one is also about relationships. You probably remember back when the academies, this was over three years ago, we did our um, report on uh, dilute disposal, plutonium, and disposal in WIP. And I remember in one of the public presentations, we, we, they showed some maps of oil and gas drilling in the region. And so I'm also kind of wondering what types of relationships do you and your team have with the oil and gas industry in the area? And uh, not that I'm, I'm worried that there's going to be you know, they're going to right now, like, drill into your <laughs> disposal site. But in terms of, ter terms of thinking about the footprint of oil and gas and, and what kinds of communications you have with, uh, those, uh, those, and with that industry. Thank you. Okay, so um, first part of the question, uh, yes, we do have um, a lot of engagement uh, internationally. So we have, I think, I've only been out here for a couple of months, but I think in the time that I've been here, we've had um, folks from France, folks from IAEA visiting, um, somebody from Britain as well. So tons of interest um, internationally in um, seeing what we do, um, seeing the facility, understanding how um, you know we were able to, um, well, how we operate, but also the history of how we were able to um, get permission and, and what we do to demonstrate the safety case. So um, I think also there's a lot of interest, right? I mean, as one of the few operating facilities, I what our lessons learned in terms of how you integrate the considerations of long-term performance and safety with operational considerations. Um, what we've learned in that regard, I think, is also of really great interest. I mean, there's only a couple of other um, facilities that are, you know, I mean, France has some lessons in that regard, Finland as well, um, that we can combine, but, um, but we really have a unique perspective, I think. Um, I would just say that that kind of confidence that you get and the understanding of the system um, by taking 
you know, the international visitors down there. I, I mean, I see it when, when we take anybody down here, right? We had folks from NNSA, even within the department who came and did a tour. And you can see it on people's faces when they see what the underground looks like, when they understand what we're, um, you know, what it actually looks like, how clean it is, how big it is, um, how we manage, you know, how the operations actually work. I think you get a much different appreciation for what we're doing, um, what it means, what the safety aspects are. So it's not, you know, it's it's a value across the board as far as I'm concerned for people to be able to see the facility. Um, in terms of your second question on the relationships and oil and gas, I have to admit, I don't know. That's one of the, I, I can try to find out. We certainly have an awareness of the, you know, the oil and gas drilling that happens. Um, it's prohibited on the, you know, the land withdrawal area. And we do have processes in place to do sequences, um, both on the ground and of um, drilling records. And we have relationships with the state to ensure that there, are, you know, are not any um, permits that are issued for drilling that could, um, that could violate that requirement. But I don't know. Um, I don't know what our direct interaction is with the oil and gas folks. And oh, but Thank actually, you. I am going to go back to Allison's question because I remember the thought that went out of my head, which is, um, which is to say that the contract transition, to my mind, is actually an incredible opportunity to revisit what we are doing to make sure that we are. Um, living up to the commitments and the requirements that we have in place for um, across the board waste certification, but also operational activities. Because my experience and the time I've been here is that they are they are taking a really close look at everything that was in place um, to make sure that, it, again, make sure that it's doing what it's intended and think about what more um, we need to do um, to ensure safety. Thank you, Pear. Uh, yes, Betsy, I, I want to reemphasize how absolutely wonderful it is to, to have this update on WIP and the amazing progress. The, the fact that, that, uh, the, you know, that, that you have this demonstration that it is feasible to manage nuclear waste safely and place it in the disposal. In, in the back of my mind is the fact that, that sometime in the coming decade or so, we need to restart a functioning civilian nuclear waste program. And that the, the set of examples that have been provided here uh, are going to be very important. Uh, we, we need a new regulation uh, is one of the starting places and then uh, congressional guidance. So, so my, my question actually relates to something you didn't talk a lot about, but which people worry about for civilian uh, spent fuel transportation, which is uh, or spent fuel, which is the transportation part, and having having WIP operating and bringing in materials from distant places around the country provides some existence proof that this can be done safely. Could, could you give a bit of an update on on how transportation is going, and uh, maybe thoughts about what that implies about our ability more generally to 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 move materials radioactive materials around safely yeah um i mean i think i mentioned we have we just passed 16 million you know loaded miles um safe transportation so really proud of the program i think um you know it's I do think it's right. I mean, it, it's like like the repository itself, it's one of the few operational examples we have, you know, not in just in the US, but in the world of um, a shipping program on this scale. And I think that uh, it is really important that we have the NRC certification. I think that that provides a level of, um, of oversight and, um, you know, that that is really important to people but you know the requirements that we have in place for our system are really incredible I, I, somebody was talking about the requirements that the drivers need to go through in order to be qualified and you know 
it's a lot, you know, it's, it's hundreds of hours of, um, you know, driving with no marks on their driving records and no accidents and incidents. Um, it's training that they have to go through. It's requirements for, um, you know, being able to, you know, have multiple drivers on a single truck. We have designated safe areas. So if they ever run into an incident, you know, we have locations that are identified along the routes with, you know, local police and fire departments or, you know, other secure places where the trucks can pull off the road and have a safe haven if needed. So there are a ton of things that go into the transportation program that I think are maybe not as visible to people, but are actually really important in ensuring that we have some resilience in that system and kind of defense in depth um, for dealing with any accidents. I do think that our public outreach on the program is really important as well. We do a lot of work along the um, the trucking route to, um, to train local first responders, um, but also just to take the trucks out and um, and talk to people in the communities. I mean, we call them road shows. You know, we take the truck out, we let people see, you know, what's on it, talk to the people who drive the trucks, talk to the people who, you know, release the trucks. And, and I think that makes a big difference. And the last thing I would say is, you know, we're also really flexible and that's something that you need to be able to do when you're doing shipping to a, adapt to um, the conditions that you're actually seeing on the road to make sure that the routes that you have um, are clear to make sure that the roads are in decent condition um, that there aren't events that are happening and you know we adjust our shipping on you know not just a weekly basis but a daily basis to you know if needed i'm going to tell you idaho is a huge challenge in that regard there's you know dude there's a lot of shipments that get pushed by a few days because you know the roads close because of snow or something. Um, but you know, but we do it. We do not send trucks out if it's not going to be safe or you know if the weather looks iffy. And I think that's part of what you also need to be willing to do to to be safe and to build public confidence. Thank you very much and congratulations. Um, I think it's time now to turn to our next presentation um, on the future of the radiation workforce by Dr. Wayne Neuhauser, who is the Charles M. Smith Chair in Medical Physics in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Louisiana State University and the Director of the Medical Physics Program. Dr. Neuhauser? Thank you, Charles. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Wayne. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that kind introduction, and thanks to the uh, committee for inviting me to present on the workforce today. We really appreciate the chance to uh, present on this. Um, being aware of the lateness of the day, for those of you on the West Coast and points further west, uh, I'll be brief in my presentation today. I'd like to uh, start by thanking uh, quite a few people. We had a, a really great team working on this. There were teams started out with about 60 people. Um, they're listed here by the profession uh, specific um, areas they, they came from. These are national and internationally recognized uh, uh, leaders in their fields. I'd like to call out Jackie Williams by name. Uh, she not only led the radiation biology group, but she was my co-leader of the overall uh, effort. I'd also like to thank John Boyce, who instigated this work. So for this audience, it almost goes without saying that we need a, a, a workforce that's uh, adequate in size and capacity in order to meet our, our nation's needs in healthcare, uh, electric power generation, nuclear propulsion for our Navy's uh, vessels, uh, defense, uh, space exploration, and so forth. And um, the good news is, of course, that the U.S. has invested heavily, and we have a fabulous community of professionals in place that's dedicated to the safe and beneficial use of radiation. But starting perhaps in the early 90, 90s, there were signs that the uh, future adequacy was, was in jeopardy. And in fact, in the last 10 years, there have been numerous uh, indicators of this. Uh, including some studies by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Government Accounting Office, Health Physics Society, uh, your organization, National Academies, 
uh, did a report on radiation chemistry in around 2012. And more recently, the NCRP published a statement uh, regarding this. Um, so what, what would be causing this? Uh, and is it unique to the radiation professions? No, it's not unique to the radiation professions. Basically, all of our industries are uh, dependent on the and influenced by the demographics of the of the U.S. population. So here you can see our population in the mid 1970s, mid 2010s, and a projection out to the mid 2050s. And the principal feature that you see here that's relevant to the workforce is you've got a large cohort of young baby boomers uh, in the workforce, entering the workforce in the mid 70s. We're now in the midst of an unprecedented wave of retirement of these folks now. So the demographic looks quite different and uh, things will, the population will presumably continue to grow and age according to projections going into uh, the decades, uh, next several decades in the future. So this is uh, one of the major underlying uh, forces at play in the workforce uh, situation. So the, uh, John Boyce initiated uh, and ran a, a workshop on the radiation workforce called WARP, Where Are the Radiation Professionals? This was held in, in 2013. And to uh, summarize some of the key findings from that uh, workshop, uh, they reported that um, there were adequate supplies of radiation professionals for some professions for the next five to 10 years, meaning leading out to, to the present day. Um, only two areas were identified with uh, certainty of having adequacy uh, of, of personnel in the short term, and those were medical physics and nuclear power. But over the longer horizon, 10 to 20 years, they felt that the projections uh, revealed that there would be insufficient numbers of, of replacements for all of the baby boomers who were retiring. And this was then uh, published uh, two years later, uh, that is the, the workshop, in the form of a statement, uh, NCRP Statement 12, was published in 2015. So in the, in the statement, I'll, I'll just share with you two quick quotes because they're particularly relevant here. Uh, and they, the statement uh, pointed out that the U.S. is on the verge of a severe shortfall of radiation professionals such that urgent national needs will not be met. Projected shortfalls will adversely affect the public health, radiation occupations, emergency preparedness, and the environment. So these are quite, quite dire warnings, and this uh, uh, was a clarion call for more action and indeed was uh, an instigating factor in the uh, present uh, workforce study that uh, I'll present next. So this study was a all volunteer effort. We gathered up about 60 experts from around the country who were leaders in their fields. Um, the team tried to exclusively use published literature. In many cases that wasn't available, in which case we did use some unpublished data where that wasn't available. We relied on expert opinion and we limited our speculation to uh, just the future outlook where, of course, that's inherently speculative. Um, we never convened, so we have no group photo. Uh, all of our meetings were done electronically. Uh, most of our business was done using online collaboration tools. And uh, we, we really, the methods, we set them up to address three particular topics. What is the current status of the workforce? What's its future outlook? and what are some actions that we could re recommend to ensure future adequacy of the workforce. Depending on how you wanna do the accounting, uh, this was about a six or eight year project, Cradle to Grave. We spent a full year in the beginning trying to figure out how to tackle the problem, how to organize ourselves, um, what questions to uh, uh, address most urgently and so forth. Then we spent about four years doing the actual research uh, took a long time to generate consensus among the, the, the writing teams and the, uh, the group as a whole. Uh, and then we got to work writing and that took about four years in total. Then we got slowed down by the pandemic a bit and what should have been a few months wound up being about two years because we were busy dealing with other things. And then 2022 was really just a pretty light year spent uh, working with a publishing house to get the um, study published. 
what we came up with uh, in terms of a, a report is a 60 page uh, summary. Uh, well, 60 page report. It's a special issue of an open access uh, journal and I've included a link here. You can download this uh, for free on your own. The study has uh, eight components, uh, beginning with an introduction, setting the stage. Then we have profession specific chapters on health physics, medical physics, medicine, including four of the most uh, uh, heavy subspecialty users of ionizing radiation, nuclear engineering, radiobiology, radiochemistry, and then we conclude with a synthesis of all of this and try to look at the radiation professions not only individually but as an interdependent ecosystem, and we provide some uh, globally applicable uh, recommendations. So in the interest of time and brevity, I picked out two recommendations, two observations really to, to share with you. Um, there are many more, but I'm going to limit it to two here. And uh, the first one was that um, really without exception, we found that there were significant limitations in uh, our ability to even determine what the current status of, of these professions were, much less temporal trends or, or predictions of, of the future. And this was somewhat counter to our expectations. We knew it wasn't going to be an exact science, but we weren't prepared for the um, uh, the general incompleteness and, and heterogeneity of the data that we actually found when we when we did our uh, rigorous literature searches. The second finding I, I thought I'd point out here was that the, um, the current status and future outlook of the professions involved in radiation protection varied considerably depending on specialty, subspecialty, and other factors. Um, this also was a surprise to us. We we knew going into it that, that the radiation professions uh, are not a monolith, um, but we underappreciated initially how um, complex and heterogeneous this ecosystem of, of distinct professions really is. This is a, a table that comes from the, the summary chapter, and we won't go through all of this, but I just wanted to show this to you to give you a sense of of the kind of information that's in this report. So let's look at just the, the top row here. Um, the, the size of a profession is one of its general characteristics that, that we would expect would be quite well known. And in fact, for the, the mature uh, and, and very established profession of health physics, we really weren't able to bracket the number of professional health physicists working in the United States um, uh, within a small bracket, the, the best estimate is somewhere between 3,200 and 7,000. Um, for medical physics, it was a little bit easier. There are about 8,000. Uh, for the four specialties that we looked at in medicine, nearly 40,000. For nuclear engineering, about 18,000. Radiobiology, just 500 or so. And for radiation uh, uh, and nuclear chemistry, um, the team was not able to even make an estimate. So even from this most general characteristic about the radiation workforce, which is its size, you see that there's about a hundred factor of 100 variation in the size. And for two of at least two of the uh, professions, we had a very limited of, uh, uh, information upon which to even base an estimate. So, I won't go into the, the rest of the contents of this table other than to try to um, summarize that in terms of my interpretation of, of the future outlook. This isn't contained in the report, but let's look at that. And so if you look at all of these, I would say that the future outlook for health physics is poor. It's good for medical physics, medicine, and nuclear engineering, but poor for radiation biology and probably poor for oops, radiation chemistry. And so <clears throat> the hallmarks of a poor prognosis, let's say, are a small uh, uh, number of, of professionals working in that area combined with uh, a shrinking uh, downward trend in the number combined with a pipeline, an education pipeline that's in jeopardy of 
of collapse. So after, uh, as I said, about six years or so, uh, 50 people, uh, six professions, we came up with four recommendations that appeared to be uh, consensus recommendations that are uh, applicable to all of the professions. So I'll just briefly go through those with you here. One was to initiate or enhance annual surveillance of radiation professionals. So some of the um, professions have none, no surveillance going on at all. Um, whereas others, uh, for example, in radiology, where it's probably the most advanced, there were even many things that are not currently data items that are not currently being collected that would be useful in, in monitoring the workforce. We'd also like to see more fostering of cooperation between the professions, coordination and harmonization, um, additional advocacy, obviously to obtain more uh, sustained funding for higher education and research. And we would also like to see more uh, uh, additional outreach activities in order to attract the best and the brightest students uh, to become the future workers in each of these in each of these disciplines. So with that, I'll close and take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, I will jump in with the first question because it's fresh in my mind from one of the last things you, you said. You cited six job categories, three of which had poor prospects, three of which had good prospects. And I just wondered if there were any and, and you characterized sort of attributes to them that indicated why they were good or they were poor, but those may be more symptoms than cause. Were there, there causes that were for the distinction between the two? Because I imagine that they may have, you know, actually a, a great deal in common. So what were the differences that caused that distinction? Well, there were some common themes um, and there were some, uh, I'd say rather um, distinct causes as well. So some common themes were uh, a career path is has to be visible to those entering the profession. And if you don't have enough entering the profession, um, it becomes hard for the pipeline to, uh, education pipeline to sustain itself. And then if there's not enough entry level workers, um, for example, in the case of health physics, I've heard many instances where employers aren't able to find a health physicist. And so they will instead hire an industrial hygienist and, and, and train them up as best they can to fulfill the role of a, of a, um, a traditional health physicist. And, and this sort of thing was also common to uh, radiation biology. But, but there, I think it was driven by a couple of, of distinct factors. As I understand it, the um, traditional radiobiology came from uh, in vivo and in vitro um, uh, experimental work. And as, as the biologic research technologies have, have exploded with you know, everything from genetic sequencing, immunology, et cetera, um, now the the folks who are interested in radiation and biology are coming from a much more diverse set of, of, of uh, areas of biology. And this tends to diminish the, the sort of the core, uh, um, the critical mass, if you will, of a, of a traditional radiation biology program. Um, and also it, it, it diminishes the ability for the, the traditional field of radiation biology to sustain itself. Um, as an identifiable uh, profession. And then it, when that happens, then, uh, um, you know, there's, there's then the common problem to health physics, which is attracting the, the best and the brightest to go into the field if, if the field looks like it, it may be in, in danger of, of um, demise. Thank you. Charles? Wayne, thank you, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. And uh, I know you just kind of scratched the surface with the findings recommended uh, actions. So I'm going to uh, raise, uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I, I love to think internationally, I love to think about the globe. And uh, so I'm going to ask questions about uh, did your, your group and your study 
look at the international dimension, and I'm thinking about it at least a couple of different ways. So anecdotally, I, I know of maybe a few uh, colleagues who are nuclear chemists, in particular, who were uh, trained or were born outside the United States, primarily trained outside the United States, and then were attracted to come to the United States because of job opportunities, and have now uh, some of you know stayed, become U.S. citizens, stayed within the U.S working here now, and, you know, that's helped certainly uh, the U.S. radiation workforce. And so I'm just thinking about uh, any data on the state of play in other countries and their programs and training these professions, and also the opportunities, uh, you know, what we have in our country or where we should have to keep attracting, you know, talented people uh, from other countries to consider coming and working in the United States and making sure our radiation profession workforce is uh, at the standards it should be. Thanks. Yeah, th those are those are all excellent points, and and the answer is uh, yes, no, and some. So yes, we did consider the, the international aspect um, in the sense that uh, the elasticity of supply is enhanced by a pool of qualified professionals from from abroad, uh, whether they're students entering the profession or fully qualified uh, senior folks. Um, we, we didn't really go too much beyond that because we wanted to focus on the domestic situation, uh, which is which was already complicated enough. Um, the, the team did like the idea of uh, trying to work with our international partners, both in research, education, et cetera, pooling resources where, where it makes, makes sense to do so. Um, learning from, uh, just for example, our, our European partners in, in Eurodos do a phenomenal job of, of uh, integrating workforce development into their radiation dosimetry uh, research uh, programs. So there's, there's, there's some of that. I think um, uh, Shaheen Duji actually um, was, was involved in organizing a uh, a research um, workshop at, at uh, uh, Oak Ridge that delved into this a little bit. Um, so we we didn't get as far into it as we would have liked to have, and there's and there's more potential for that. I don't think that it's a like a bottleneck. Uh, I think that there are enough well qualified um, students to be attracted to the field regardless of where they come from. I think the, the, the major concerns uh, lie elsewhere. Shaheen, since uh, your name was mentioned, do you, uh, do you have a two finger response? And Shaheen's a good example of someone from Canada who's working in the United States. Yes, um, <clears throat> so, so just to dovetail a little bit on, on uh, Wayne's reference to the study that we conducted in 2017, actually in response to WARP, um, I had uh, an interesting challenge with to John Boyce regarding workforce development in that maybe we should be a little more nuanced instead of just warm body to warm body. Let's add an element of dimensionality regarding research needs and priorities. And so I could see this workforce study also addressing now looking at current uh, policy goals, climate change goals, nuclear security goals, many of the items that this board is interested in also in the framework of a workforce and capabilities need. And uh, if you're interested in that report from 2017, it was an ORNL document and I, I can pull it up and put it in the chat, but it's freely available if you Google it. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, you know, what a difference five years makes because I've been in meetings just in the last few months in which both the DOE and the nuclear industry uh, people are saying they we need to add 300,000 jobs in the nuclear field by 2050. And two of the areas that they're emphasizing specifically are health physics and nuclear chemistry. So, you know, uh, obviously this is being driven by, by the, uh, the interest in, in adding new nuclear uh, in, in the U.S. And, and particularly some of these uh, small reactor vendors who are developing this area. And, and I would point out that this is, this is a broader group, not just uh, um, not just a, a college educated, but also in technician area too. So, so anyway, this that's kind of interesting. So we're 2018, five years later. Now, now we're having a 
uh, a different view of the future for these job uh, categories. So I'm wondering, are you going to try to do this again? Because I, I think your point you raise is there's nobody really within those industry groups that really is kind of monitoring this effort. Is that correct? Is that what I heard you say? Yes, Paul, thank you. That's a, a really good point. And um, uh, I, I do think that, um, well, I, to your first point, I, I should note that that really, truth be told, because of the lag time of, of the collection and publication of data uh, that we used, and then the lag time of the publication of our report, really our report should be viewed as a uh, immediate pre-pandemic snapshot. Yeah. So things things have changed quite a, quite a bit since 2020. Uh, just to underscore your your point about how how quickly things can can change. That said, the long term trends are clear. Is we're going to need to pay much closer attention to this. And and yes, to to answer your second question, I think um, much more can and, and should be done. Um, some of the society professions are doing a good job at surveying their members as, as best they can. But, but really, um, in my experience uh, with this, none of these, these folks are all like us. They're not labor economists. Um, they have their day jobs. And so this is something that, that they, they, they do as a volunteer. There's typically an annual survey for those professions that have a, a professional society that, that, that feels that they're um, uh, you know, it's important to do, which, which wasn't all of them. And, um, so there's, but that, that doesn't mean that they're unimportant or shouldn't be counted. I mean, you know, if, if the weakest link in a, in a chain breaks, the whole chain breaks, right? So we need radiation chemistry, we need health physics. And if these are or radiobiology, if these fields are small, um, as a, as a radiation professions ecosystem, we're still highly dependent on them. So it, it is incumbent upon us to um, surveil them and, and revisit this. I think, you know, having some, doing a decadal uh, uh, workforce study, I would think would be a minimum. I think it's a little bit easier to do this if there's something going on annually, and then perhaps every several years, if the situation um, has, has, has evolved enough, come out with a, you know, a new update or a guidance or publication, um, but certainly making rational, informed um, decisions along the lines of what, what Paul Black was talking about earlier it requires having some, some accurate, up-to-date input data upon which to, to make those decisions. Thank you. Amy? Yeah, um, thank you, Wayne, and for spending all your spare time on that report as well. It's, it's really an impressive piece of work uh, and, and really informative as well. Uh, so I was curious, though, about the field of um, public health radiation protection workers. Uh, which Were they within one of your one of those categories or was there some reason for not considering them. I'd imagine they're even smaller number than, than radiobiologists. <clears throat> yes, Amy, hi, thank, thank you for that, that question. We did have, uh, uh, you'll be happy to know that there actually is a, um, a corresponding piece on radiation epidemiology. Uh, that team felt it would be better to publish in the Health Physics Journal. Um, to my knowledge, that hasn't appeared in, in, in uh, it hasn't been published yet, but I think it will be very soon. Um, that was a part of it. And more generally to your question, there's there's many additional um, workers, for example, uh, radiation uh, technologists of, of various sorts, um, mm. health physics techs, mm -hmm. therapy techs, et cetera. And uh, these you know, are in the hundreds of thousands. So in terms of including additional professions who would be relevant to say um, emergency response, it would be extremely important to include these in a, in a future study. The only reason why we didn't include them was um, just bandwidth. And already we started the team with about 60 workers, uh, so, sorry, 60 workers, 60 volunteers. And um, that was a handful. So uh, I think that, that it should be expanded out to, especially to include the, the, the cohorts that are of, of relevance to public health and emergency response. Okay. Oh, thank you. I didn't know about the other activities. So that sounds like an important report as well. 
Uh, and so just another comment um, and within some of the other National Academy boards, there have been discussion, similar discussions about shortage of, of uh, scientists and projected future problems in the field as well. Uh, Charles and I were in a cross-board meeting when that was being discussed. So I, I wonder if it's helpful to, to learn a bit. Of, I think there's probably some similarities in, in, in some of the areas in terms of the underlying training uh, and whether, particularly given how much effort it is to 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 monitor this and produce these sorts of reports, but also then to think about some potential solutions, whether thinking about some cross uh, cross board cross application initiatives might be helpful. Um, Charles, do you remember? In the, yeah, sorry, Wayne. I, I was just Charles and I were in a particular meeting, and I'm trying to remember now. Uh, what the other board was that was raising similar concerns. I, I would tend to yeah. agree with that, that, that looking at um, multiple disciplines is, is actually, in, in many ways, makes it easier. Um, and ultimately, we will succeed or, or fail together. So um, certainly from the standpoint of ensuring uh, adequacy of the entire Higher ecosystem, it has some advantages. Yes, absolutely. Carl, sorry I interrupted. Oh, uh, no, Wayne, that's helpful. And I, I'm glad Amy brought that up because she's referring to our division's advisory committee meeting. And uh, earlier this morning, we had our, our division executive director, Elizabeth Ada, in the room. And part of her efforts is to get this. Uh, conversation going among the different boards in the, our division. We have 11 different boards or units within the division on earth and life studies. So we cover everything from life science, life studies, so biology, you know, of course, chemistry, and that's the other, other board I manage. So, you know, we're talking about nuclear chemistry and Wayne in our preparatory call to get ready for this meeting, you and I talked a bit about the study that was done, uh, I guess, 10, 11 years or so ago on the nuclear chemistry, radiochemistry workforce. And that was the collaboration between two of our boards, this Nuclear Radiation Studies Board we're talking at now, and the Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology, the other board that I manage. And so it might be worth you know, revisiting that, but I think Amy's larger point, I think we're seeing across the board, I think it's because one of your initial slides you hit the nail on the head thinking about the demographics, certainly in the United States and I think in other countries as well, especially in the developed world where we see we had that the baby boom and now, uh, you know, they're moving through into retirement. And so that's having significant changes in, in the workforce and, and not just in radiation health, but many, many professions. <laughs> I agree on all points. Madeline. Thanks, Will. Um, I, you, you may actually have answered part of the question, uh, and it really was to your recommendation on surveillance. Um, one of the one of the things that I've um, always have found interesting is is there are lots of concerns about the inadequacy of the workforce writ large. One of the things that I have also um, seen not well. Um, sort of organizer presented is how do you assess what the requirement really is over what period of time? And you mentioned that decadal workforce study, and that might be something that you would suggest be included in that as well. But that's that's the sort of the flip side of we're not enough, and it's like, well, how do you know when we have enough? Thanks. Absolutely. So uh, de delineating supply and demand are are two very very separate and, and equally important um, questions, and so. Um, what we what we found in the course of this was was that many of us were, were you know we consider ourselves experts, but we weren't even familiar with all of the terminology that's used to describe many of these professionals. So I think health physics is a good example where there's a half dozen or so terms that can be applied to people who who um, are professionals and work on radiation protection, ranging from health physicist to radiation protection manager. And when you're trying to surveil or assess um, um, 
the state of affairs in, in these, it, it becomes difficult. Just, just as an example, this afternoon I got a, um, a job posting, and sometimes we use job postings to try to estimate um, the changes in, in demand. And the, the posting was for a medical physics physicist, a health physicist, or a nuclear engineer. Um, so it's, it, there's a lot of overlap. Um, the fields of medical physics and health physics, which are distinct and separate, both have subspecialties called medical health physics. So <laughs> yes, we need to work on that. And a decadal study would be a, a, a great place to do that. Lawrence? Oh, great, thanks very much. Wayne, excellent uh, presentation. And I really encourage folks to go to the JC, uh, JACMP uh, uh, open access for all of the details. And, and I think the where are the radiation professionals question or the warp uh, question is important as, as, as everyone has discussed. But I think just as in textiles where you have the warp and the weft, I think we also in this country have an issue where where we could ask, where are the radiation facilities? You know, you, you need training facilities to develop individuals. And, uh, you know, if you just look at the history of, of each of the, uh, you know, small reactors for uh, that were at universities, most of those are gone. Uh, we're we're blessed, I guess you could say, as a country to at least have the facilities at AFRI and at, at, at some of the labs. But I, I think a, it may be an area that um, and uh, the academies could look at kind of the interplay between the, both of those, both, both the, the equipment and facilities and technologies, uh, as well as the individuals. I think they go hand in hand. But, that's, but, that's absolutely thanks. Uh, correct. Thanks, Larry, for that. And uh, more generally, I, I would say that the facilities are, are part and parcel of an institution. And uh, much of the early training is done by, by universities. And there's about 1.3 million missing students since the start of the pandemic. And this is uh, moving forward in time, a long predicted uh, enrollment crisis, which will put um, uh, institutions of higher education under additional stress. Um, a typical response to uh, financial stress is find out the small expensive programs that are losing money and cut them. And so in addition to a potential die-off of large numbers of, of institutions of higher education, the, the smaller niche programs are, are particularly vulnerable. So your, your point is very well taken and um, should, should, should be considered in, in a consideration of the institutional well-being as well. Related to that question and answer, I would note that several years ago, I was on an academies committee that um, was really um, aimed at assessing efforts to refuel highly enriched research reactors to low enriched fuel. But our first recommendation as a committee was that the United States should inventory neutron needs and sources over a 50 year period to enable there to be planning because it's a yeah. It's a highly de decentralized system with lots of different players, both providing and demanding neutrons. Excellent point. Would that be allowed with the increased controls? I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't quite understand. Oh, just getting some of the information on uh, isotopic sources, uh, as I understand it, has become more difficult with uh, the recent uh, increased regulatory controls. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the details of the regulation, but our proposal was that the government should do this. So I assume that oh, there were- well, they would probably have that information already <laughs> anyway. Yes, that's an excellent idea. They hadn't, as at least as of the study committee, they hadn't really assembled it. Um, and they didn't have a good projection in the, the future. Even they didn't have actually current data on either of those things, but they certainly didn't have good projections long into the future. And of course, these facilities last for decades and require a long time to build. Yes. I 
don't see any other questions unless there are further ones in the in the room. Well, then um, it only remains to thank you very much for a great presentation and you generated lots of questions and had interesting answers. So uh, thank you again. And with that, I will call this session adjourned. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.